Good morning. Four minutes after 10 is the time. I hope you're well today. Just a quick heads up. Um, if, if you're not remotely interested in television in general, or I'm a celebrity, get me out of here in particular, don't worry. This conversation absolutely involves you and, and includes you. But that particular televisual entertainment is the lens through which we're going to examine rather bigger and more important issues. There will be a small side order of Matt Hancock, um, who has gone into the jungle in order to uh, rehabilitate his reputation, I think, is probably the only way of describing it, although his own rather mealy-mouthed explanations are sort of closer to showing that politicians can be human too. Um, But I'm, I'm more interested in something that happened while Boy George was on screen last night. And it, it really took me by surprise, actually. And, and, and it really focused my mind on something that has been puzzling me for a while, although I hadn't really realised it was puzzling me. I get cross. I got very cross when they used to talk about Boris Johnson getting all the big calls right. Do you, do you remember when they were trying to gloss over whatever scandal we were talking about that week, whether it was uh, Owen Patterson or, or, or whether it was going to parties or lying about going to parties, whether it was the colleagues and, 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 and employees of his that were um, uh, puking in the corridors on the night before uh, the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral. I, I mean, this guy, you, you name it, 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 it happened. I, scandal after scandal after scandal after scandal. But also, of course, the utter failure to protect care homes, the, the, the policy decision to send infected pensioners into care homes where they essentially... Um, spread the plague like wildfire, causing untold deaths and misery, and, and of course, necessitating a much longer and more stringent lockdown than may have been needed otherwise. The failure to act, uh, the, the, the failure to attend five COBRA meetings, throughout which Matt Hancock always portrayed himself as a man more sinned against than sinning. He, he always sought to portray himself as, I think he even claimed he'd thrown a, a protective ring around the care homes, which was the polar opposite of the truth. And that's what's been bothering me for a while, the fear that they have rewritten history even as it unfolded. When Johnson was trying to get back into power, I mean, the two things that they usually talk about were getting Brexit done and and the success of the vaccine rollout. Well, Brexit isn't done, and the bits that are done are a disaster. We'll get onto that a little later in the programme. The the, the intervention now from one of the few business people you could find to say that it was a good idea, now whining ceaselessly about the impacts and the damage that it's done to his business. Ahead of next, can't get people to work in his shops. What a surprise. What did you think was going to happen when they abolished freedom of movement? So those two lines... We got Brexit done and the vaccine rollout. The vaccine rollout, we got a small head start on other countries, but they caught us up in, in, in moments. And in fact, even in Europe, we're not, we're not at the top of the list for, in terms of percentage of the population that have been vaccinated. So they're just not true, those claims. But they also speak to a, a deliberately cultivated sense that he'd done a good job during coronavirus. And if Johnson did a good job, then obviously the Secretary of State for Health must have played a blinder. And that's so at odds, really, with the reality that we observed and shared, that I have been, without really realising it until last night, I've been struggling with the question of how you set the record straight. There are books being written. There are some that have already been published. Adam Wagner's book on the legal side of things, the legislative side of things, is is seminal and definitive. But the, um, but the, 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 the health side of it, the, the, I don't know if you've walked past the wall where there is a, 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 a tiny memorial for everyone who died. I don't know if you've paid much attention to what the, 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 the bereaved family groups have had to say. They've been sort of squeezed out of the narrative. And the reason why they've been squeezed out of the narrative is, and I know we return to this a lot, and I know most people don't rely on newspapers these days for their news, but they still set the agenda. The reason very simply is because... They were all so busy cheerleading for Boris Johnson. They were all so busy insisting that he was a stand-up guy who could be trusted with the security and the welfare of the nation. All of these people, this bizarre mix of, of sycophants and cultists, these forelock tugging delusionists who, you know, sat behind microphones on radio programs, appeared on television, wrote newspaper columns, edited newspapers, all dedicated to promoting the cult of Boris Johnson. It means that they are somehow psychologically, never mind intellectually prevented from telling the truth about what happened. And I can't quite believe that I'm saying these words, but Boy George really brought it home to me last night. 
in a way that I was totally not expecting. Listen, I was struggling to watch it anyway because I, I, I don't know how people do it. How do people stay hateful and angry? Like far-right people, racists. Uh, how do you do it? I, you're just exhausting. I can't hold Matt Hancock in much lower esteem. But five minutes after he's in the jungle, and I'm bent double cringing. I, I can't watch this. This is awful. It's not even that he's being bullied. It's that he's, oper- he's, in, he's inhabiting a reality that's just alien to everybody else. Even the other people in the camp are, I mean, a curious mixture of disgusted and outraged at the fact that he's there. I suppose the kindest thing you could say is deeply confused. Chris Moyles, I think, is playing a blinder. Yeah, but then again, I would say that is a pal of mine. But he, 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 I think he's going to be the, the, the big surprise on this series because he's a really lovely bloke. And he's so different from the public image that he had in his Radio 1 days that he's going to win an awful lot of new friends and, uh, and admirers. So, so watch this space. But they're all a curious mixture of discombobulated or, or, or disgusted or just confused by Matt Hancock's presence there. And he thinks he's on some sort of rehabilitation program i i felt really uncomfortable with the way he was so obviously being set up for epic national humiliation even though he probably deserves it i just it's my character how do you do it racists how do you stay so angry and so hate people who constantly if you spend their lives on twitter abusing jess phillips or diane abbott how do you do it I'm agog at your energy levels. Imagine if you dedicated them to something healthy. Imagine how happier your family would be if you weren't built like that. So even someone who I think there's quite a strong case for hating, five minutes of him being exposed to this kind of treatment, and I'm, I am close to feeling sorry for him. Until this happened, until Boy George went into the, the is it the diary room? or That's Big Brother, isn't it? Anyway, went into the sort of private area and spoke about his feelings at seeing the former Secretary of State for Health turn up on what is essentially a glorified game show, albeit a a, a rather high-stakes one. And it really stopped me in my tracks. Just have a little listen. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, my mum was in hospital and I wasn't allowed to see her and I thought she was going to die. And I was tweeting Greenwich Hospital saying, please look after my mum, you know. I used my name, I was like, please look after her. And they did, and she was fine. But I feel like I don't want to be sitting here like I'm having fun with him. You know, it's difficult for me because... You know, had something happened, if my mum had gone, I wouldn't be here now. Oh. I would, I would be, I would have gone. He walked in. If I'd have lost my mum, I would go. And I feel a little bit selfish, you know, just kind of, you know, everyone was so nice to him, and I was like, Jesus, you know. But then of course, what are we gonna do? I don't want to spoil this this experience for myself. I'm not good at hiding what I feel. Wow. Um, and that was the point at which I went, crikey, people really do associate him with the deaths of their loved ones. People really do see Matt Hancock and presumably Boris Johnson's fingerprints all over bereavement and grief. And I I, I mean, I don't know whether that's 100% fair. If Boy George had lost his mum, Mrs O'Dowd, as she, as she would be, um, would it have been fair to blame Matt Hancock for that? So I'm looking at this and I'm looking at that and I'm thinking this is a really bad move by ITV. This isn't a game show. This isn't something funny. This isn't light entertainment. This is attempting to make fun and frivolity out of someone whose reputation and whose status, whose sole qualification for getting onto that program in the first place is presiding over something that many people consider to be carnage to be avoidable carnage. And I said to you, if you're just tuning in, I can't quite believe the direction my thoughts have gone in as a consequence of watching 10 minutes of I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here last night. But I couldn't work out why I felt so uncomfortable. I thought it was the bullying element, the way Hancock is being so obviously set up for a massive fall. But it was Boy George's work. Well, listen to Hancock himself, and, and, and you get an air of how seriously, how heavily the burdens of the COVID-19 crisis weigh upon his shoulders as he enters into this jungle. I'm Matt Hancock, I'm the MP for West Suffolk, and I'm best known for being the former health secretary. Don't think I've got any fears or phobias, but I'm about to find out. (laughs) Hi. (laughs) Hello. Hi. How's it going? I'm Matt. Sean. Very nice to meet you. So this is camp. This is oh you my and me. God. Hello, yes. I thought there were going to be more people. Why didn't? Yeah, why are you here? Because 
there's honest truth is because there's so few ways in which politicians can show that we're human beings. Oh my God, two new people have arrived. One of them is Sean Walsh and the other one, I've got to go back and double check. I can't help but think he should be at work. Oh, oh, that's a load of slurry. Just pulled on my head. Wait, are you still carrying on? Yeah, wait for me. OK, come down the tunnel. Is that your shoe? That's your yeah, foot? Yeah, that's my foot. I'm not going to, you know, put a tattoo but, of Ed but, Sheeran on my neck, Ed, I? You like Ed Sheeran? I love him, yeah. I love Ed Sheeran. And I'm from Suffolk as well. OK, lovely. Yeah. You between my arms. That one. Barefoot on the cross. Don't get me singing, I'm terrible. No, no, Listening good, good. to my favourite song. When you saw you... What's it called? Perfect. It's called Perfect. The only thing Alison writes, Matt Hancock is doing in I'm a Celebrity, is reminding us all of what we lost, how much we suffered while they made shed loads of money and partied. Any feelings that had calmed have now been reignited. And I think we give prominence and priority today to people who did lose loved ones during the COVID-19 crisis and who consider the government's response to that crisis, uh, inadequate and belated as it was, to have been a contributing factor to their grief. But I also want to open the door to the possibility that I'm completely calling this wrong. And just because I felt uncomfortable watching this last night and was profoundly moved by Boy George's tears, Matt Hancock has every right to have a crack at getting a new career or, 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 or that it is a complete misrepresentation. It's my own political myopia that, that, that sees him and Johnson as being responsible for utterly unavoidable tragedy and that it is in the, in the words of was it Brian Connolly's character many moons ago it's just it's only a game show or something like that I forget don't don't at me someone will at me but I, I, I'm, 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 am I making a mountain out of a light entertainment molehill or is there something profoundly unsettling about ITV's decision to put man, Matt Hancock in the jungle? That, that's my starter question. We may move on to something a bit more frivolous. We may move on to something a bit more uh, palatable, I suppose, or, 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 or a bit less uncomfortable. But, but my starter for 10, my starter at 10 this morning is, it, it, is, it, is it just me? I can't do this every day. I can't do any. Is it just me? Or that's like the worst kind of newspaper columnist. But sometimes it fits. It's when you start doing it every day that you're being lazy. Is it just me? And boy, George. And some of the other camp mates, jungle members. Or is there something profoundly inappropriate and even perhaps unsettling about ITV's decision to put a man on a game show when some of the people buried as a consequence perhaps of his political decisions, they won't even have gravestones yet, will they? Because it takes so long for the soil to settle. I just, I just couldn't believe it. I tuned in expecting to be laughing my head off at his misfortune, schadenfreude or, or perhaps indulging a slightly um, um, unkind side of my own character. That didn't happen. I, I was wincing on his behalf, which is probably just proof of what a snowflake I am. But when I wasn't wincing on his behalf, I, I, I was actually quite troubled. Do I need to get over myself? Or do you agree? And if you lost somebody, God forbid, or, or really suffered more than I did during that period, then I, I think your thoughts, your insights will be much more interesting than mine. Whatever they are, whatever side of this particular question you come down on. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. It's 1018. 21 minutes after 10 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, 21 minutes after 10 is the time. Uh, I, I just in terms of sli slightly surreal exchanges, um, Midge Yore, the, the, the legend of, of Ultravox and, of course, Band-Aid, has, has just tweeted me a reminder that Ben Elton's book, Chart Throb, actually sees a royal go on to a TV show in the hope of rehabilitating his reputation. So, as Midge suggests, it's, it's life imitating art here. And, of course, with, with Twitter now being in such a state of flux and it, 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 even a blue tick means that it might not actually be the person that is saying it is so you have to click on it and see the account is verified because it's notable not because someone's paid 6.99 a, a month anyway we digress we're talking about matt hancock i'll read you a couple of texts and then we'll talk to lisa who's in sheffield this is from stacy my brother-in-law sir graham vick died last year um, of COVID and is on the wall you speak of. Matt Hancock has the right to rebuild his life, but this is a move by the Tories to draw a line under Partygate. He should be sent home 
immediately. Um, so Graham Vick actually was an opera director, I think, if memory serves. And we are going to be talking about opera a little later in the programme because of a very Nadine Dorries flavoured assault upon the English National Opera. Um, and and Stacey is far from alone. But my question is simple. Is, is, is there something... <sighs> Uh, pro properly unsettling about Matt Hancock's presence on I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. And I wasn't expecting to ask this question. And don't don't send me messages saying things like, oh, well, you're talking about it, so it's worked. Because obviously uh, there's no such thing as bad, bad publicity or all publicity is good publicity or there's only one thing worse than being talked about and that's not being talked about. We're all very familiar with the, with the greeting card level cliche of that observation. But I talk about stuff because I find it interesting and important. And if it, if it happens to, to fall in within the parameters of a plodding cliche, like, well, you're talking about it, then you're part of the problem. I can live with that. I certainly don't need it pointing out, Keith. So it's 23 minutes after 10, and Lisa is in Sheffield. Lisa, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello, Lisa. Uh, first time caller. Quite nervous because um, it's I'm quite me. upset about... I know, I know that. I'm quite upset about what I'm going to talk about, really. Yeah. Uh, my mum passed away in uh, April of this year, oh. so it's quite raw what's happened to us as a family. Yes, uh, My mum was in a residential home for, uh, for four years, but she suffered from dementia. So the two years of the last part of her life that we weren't able to see her, we weren't able to touch her, we weren't able to hug her, we had to see her in a, like a box outside with a screen where she was touching it all the time to touch us. We weren't able to hug her. And oh, people awful. with dementia just want a hug. They want to see people who are familiar to them. And I feel Matt Hancock yesterday brought it all back to us as a family. Me and my sister was ringing up between adverts. I don't really... <laughs> I don't really say that I hate the man, no. but what he brings to our lives now is all, it all comes back to us. And it's very fresh uh, in your memory and in your mind, obviously, isn't it? Is it, is it, yeah. I mean, I, I am not going to it, it, it challenge anything that you said or how you feel because it's you and, and, and it's, and it's true. But is it, is it fair to think that, it could have unfolded differently if better people had been in charge. Or, or, or was that isolation, that separation from your mum, more of a public health issue than a specific politician's? Yeah, at the time, everybody was doing as they were told. Yeah, well, we, were. we was as a family. Of course. Uh, and we was doing everything in, in our power to to be... My sister became a, a caregiver, so she was able to go in. But as soon as any COVID come into the home... She had to stop going in, so it all went back to square one again. So it was 28 days before we could see her again. So it was like that. But when there was when there was party gay, and when the, yeah. when I just find last night when Chris Moyles, I know he's a friend of yours, and yeah. he's coming over really well. But even when he made a bit of a joke about, "Will you say one thing for me?" Next slide, please. Yeah, I thought that was that just like just tipped me a little bit. Yeah. But boy George came over the most amazing guy because we were just thinking they're just laughing at they're just laughing with him and that I'm really glad that some of the people in there were able to become come over like boy George did like really human and Charlene and White as well bringing all her exactly. journalistic mouse to the table yeah. wasn't she and asking him clever yeah. questions and, and thoughtful questions that he just failed to answer if, if, if we were five years down the line would, would, yeah. would this be okay do you think no, no, definitely not. Definitely, I don't even think he, sh he should be. I know he's an MP and everything, but for now, I, yeah, for <laughs> now, yeah, exactly. But I just feel about the Tories in general. Yes, if I can say that, of course you can. I just, I just, I just haven't got the time of day for them. And it is I part. Really I, I think it is part of, and you may disagree. Um, it is part of this sense, and I hadn't really settled on me until last night, but I, I think it settled on you and your sister, that they've sort of just waltzed away from it all. They've, they're, they're, you know, Johnson claiming, all of his allies claiming yeah. he got all the big calls right while you're looking at some really traumatic memories, it, it, right yeah. up to and including loss. Yeah, and my, ch my children, I've got two, two sons, yeah. and they lost the grandma, and they weren't able, because we only could, only two people could go in, Right. And oh. 
they weren't even able to see her in the and that is the worst thing ever that your mum was asked my mum said how's the boys but she couldn't remember the names anymore she couldn't remember what they did as a job because we wasn't seeing her regular yeah uh, no, it's just not right it's just i don't uh, I and think if we, it, go on everybody's everybody's got an opinion and I've, I value everybody's opinion and I listen to them. But if you've not been through what we've been through, everybody's got a story to tell about COVID. Yes. And this is my story. And I just wanted to let people know how how, how you feel. It is. How you feel. Yeah. And I think you should. I'm glad yeah. you can. I'm glad I could help you do that, Lisa. I really am. Thank you. No, thank you. And, thank take, you. and, and take care. Because that's the point, isn't it, about this question, in a way. If we could remove emotion from... The equation if we could somehow robotify ourselves and, and, and become computers then it may be that the the, the, the the algorithm that emerged or the equation that emerged would not have any link between Matt Hancock's decision making Matt Hancock's behavior Matt Hancock's conduct and the grief and the and the, and the sorrow and now because he's on this telly show the the unhappiness and the anger of people like Lisa but this is one of those areas where feelings matter because that's really what the the decision-making process speaks to on this. Shall we put Matt Hancock in the jungle? Yeah, why not? I mean, it'll cause a huge brouhaha. But it's going to upset a hell of a lot of people. I can't believe that conversation wasn't had and that at some point in the decision-making process, somebody said, yeah, great, so what? Let's crack on. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I do know this. They send out millions of invitations and many people say no some people enter into bidding wars there's haggling they send out complete what we call flyers you know the, the idea that somebody is going to uh say yes when uh, it's a, a million to one shot you know asking taylor swift or something like that uh, I, but and, and matt hancock would have been on that list, I think. It would have, there's no way he's going to do it. I mean, you never know. He's a bit weird and he's, he's, he's a bit pleased with himself. You never, but, but it just... Well, anyway, you know the question that I'm asking. Is this a little bit more serious than a mere misstep or a, or a, or a strange casting decision? Is it actually quite hurtful? A, the invitation being issued and B, Matt Hancock somehow being in a space, a mental space, where he thinks that this is a good idea or a good thing to do. Holly Harris is here now with your headlines. 10.34 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Hancock in the jungle. Last week I thought it was terrible, James, but now I think it's great. It's reignited the Johnson skip fire and has got people talking about the regime failings just as memories had started to fade. Um, I bet the conservative spin doctors are livid. I don't know that they will be because Johnson's not in the chair anymore. Um, I... I I disagree with you, actually, because of people like our last caller. I just, I just, that Boy George bit just made me think, crikey, this is really rubbing the faces of people who are grieving in the possibility that they didn't have to be grieving. That if, if you know, the, I mean, I think the rough estimate is 20 to 35,000 fewer deaths if Hancock and Johnson had gone into the first lockdown just one week earlier. And there he is, kind of fannying around on telly it just seems odd but more than odd it seems it seems quite profoundly wrong to me but you know sometimes i end up building castles in the sky or or, or, or overthinking stuff have i done that today what do you think stevens in mildenhall stephen what would you like to say yeah that's hancock um, country isn't it mate it is hancock country yeah uh yeah he's obviously uh on a jolly in Australia, um, while everybody else is struggling with the cost of living. That's another good uh, point. Yeah, yeah so, you know, I, I also work in health and social care. I'm actually a tutor, I deliver apprenticeships. And I experienced, you know, with my students firsthand, the stress that they were put under by him and his incompetence. So it's it's a it tough really one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to jump in, but I, I, I do think that this is a tough one. A lot of what was done had to be done, but what they did, they did late and they did badly. 
So, yeah. it, it, you know, even even if they'd got everything 100% right, which is, to be fair to the fella, impossible. Nobody's ever 100% right about anything. Even that bloke who wrote a book called How to Be Right. The, 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 the problem is that we can't separate the stuff that didn't need to happen from the stuff that did need to happen. I just want to just remind everybody of that, Stephen. It's not a criticism of you, but your students would have suffered even if the government had called everything correctly. Absolutely, and mm. there, there is, and you do have to be honest. And actually, as at the beginning, at, you talk about hopium. I actually emailed him to to thank him for what they actually did, right. because I thought that he deserved the credit where it was due. But yes. actually, with the PPE, with, with yeah. everything that was wrong, it, there was just so much that could have been avoided, and and we're still, you know. Health and social care is creaking yes, at the is. moment. Yes, it is. It is absolutely creaking. And that's all down to him and his government that have been in power for 12 years. And this is what makes me angry is, unfortunately, the Tories will get back in here because this is Tory heartland. You mean but, in Suffolk? You mean in, in, in the yes, constituency, in Suffolk, the West yeah, Suffolk constituency? Yeah, where we are right now. Mm. You know, I mean, it sure. might not be Hancock, but it will be the Conservative sure. Party. And it's just heartbreaking for me to see him going into a different career where everybody else is left to suffer. What else could he do, though? I, I'd appreciate I haven't answered this question yet, so it's a bit unfair to spring it on you. But it does, it does occur to me, we probably don't want him to stay in politics. He's got to try and make a living doing something else. I, I mean, John Profumo, after his scandal, spent the rest of his life working with homeless people on that down by embankment but um but but that, i don't think that's a, a reasonable expectation what else could he do um to be honest that isn't my concern whilst he's my mp great answer <laughs> I, I want, have you been I media trained be, Stephen? <laughs> no i haven't I, I really haven't that's I a just, brilliant I answer just, yeah that's that's what i think i just feel that he should be doing his job right now like yeah. we all I don't care what he does next any more than I care what Dirty Gertie from number 30 does a week next Tuesday. This is, this is what I'm exactly. talking about now. He's my MP and he's sitting in the jungle eating kangaroo's testicles. While it would appear not carrying much of a burden. He talks about, well, do, do I have any fears or phobias? He said, yeah, I, 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 hope that I, 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 I have a terrible fear that there's an afterlife and I'm going to bump into all the people whose deaths I possibly caused. That might have been an interesting little contribution to the conversation he could have made. Thank you, Stephen. And, of course, Stephen reminds us it's not just people who were bereaved. There's all of the other stuff that happened. Julian Suffolk, who is uh, a, a, a something of an encyclopedia on these matters, reminds us that 2 million people currently have long COVID. There have been over 200,000 deaths, and we have a death rate. I haven't checked this, but I trust Julia, 100 times higher than Japan, which managed to avoid national lockdowns. So Japan's population is roughly the same size as ours, and their geographical situation is roughly the same as ours in the context of coastlines and, and, and islands. So, you know, God, man, that, that, he got all the big calls right, eh? And, and Hancock is very much a standard bearer for that, that disgusting, that despicable lie that is at the very heart of Boris Johnson's premiership. And to think that over 100 Tory MPs wanted to bring him back. Incredible. It's been confirmed, by the way, by the, by the chair of the 1922 committee. He did have the numbers to stand against Rishi Sunak, but he didn't have the numbers to lead any, any form of viable government. 10.40 is the time. Fran is in Denham. Fran, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, we've spoken before. I'm one of the spokespeople for COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice. Yes. I'm, I'm also one of the group of women who go to the National COVID Memorial Award in London every week. Right. To, and well, we help to create it yes. and we maintain it. And there are hearts on that wall, one for every person who died it's from an, COVID. It's, 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 an, on their death it's, it's an incredible sight, isn't it? It's an incredible monument. It is, and it's extremely overwhelming for people when they go there for the first time, even yeah. if they haven't been bereaved, as we have. Yeah. And I just wanted to thank you for talking about this in such a, 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 a sympathetic way to, to, you know, to appreciate mm. the fact that, for me, for hundreds and thousands of other people who have been really, really traumatised by seeing this idiot gurning and cavorting all over the television... You know, hearing about him going into the jungle was bad enough. Yeah. Seeing him and, and the kind of nonstop coverage that we're getting um, is, is really, really triggering. You know, because people died. 
and this man was in charge. It, it, it is impossible. To it is impossible for you to separate him from the from the Completely phenomenon. Completely impossible. You know, the, the COVID inquiry is underway. What is he doing? Yeah. What is he doing? Where is the seriousness? Where is the understanding of the role that he had, the play, the absolutely important role that he had? He was in charge of health, for God's sake. And um, he failed. Well, can he I can, can I ask you to answer that question then? What what is he doing? Uh, and he's 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 lining his pockets. He's getting as much coverage as possible for the launch of his bloody book. Sorry, James. That's quite his book right. that is coming out next month. Right. You know, this man is he he's the most narcissistic well, second most narcissistic politician we've had in recent years. You know, and and yes. I I cite Boris Johnson as being Of course. Just I think I think I think we'd work that out. <laughs> yeah, but you know, he's he's you know he's. It is. It is. The more we talk about it, and you've obviously been processing this more deeply than I have because of your personal loss. Um, you lost your husband, didn't you? I, I did. Yeah. Yes. Um, it, it, the more we talk about it, the more remarkable it is. It, how 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 angry are you with the broadcaster? How angry are you with ITV for issuing the invitation? Because what I th- was struck by last night was the discomfort, the genuine discomfort of the other campmates. You know, Chris's little gag notwithstanding, I completely understand why that uh, uh, upset our first caller, but they, they were a, a curious mixture of shocked and unimpressed. It was, it, was a, it was a specific type of shock. Do you think ITV has a case to answer here? Oh, 100%. Mm. They, they've made a calculated decision that the fee that they're paying him was worth it for the coverage they're getting. And they've manipulated and, and really treated the, the other contestants really badly. You know, they're, they're in a situation now where they've got to put up with him being there. Yeah, or that's right. Out. Yeah. And that's not OK. And I, you know, I have spoken to all the media companies pretty much in this country as a yes. spokesperson for our group. I personally will never... Give another interview to ITV. Gosh, that's how strongly I feel. They have they have disregarded us. If 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 we of thousands of people. If we ever sit down for a vimto, I might try and talk you out of that because you're such a powerful advocate for the the, the cause that you represent and the people that we lost. That I I, I but but today is not the day to do that, Fran. I, I just. Well, yeah, I may, I, I because, you, I'm you, sure you understand. I that. completely it, understand. I completely that could have understand. been called. That decision could have been Absolutely called. Somebody could. with some decency at ITV could have said this is not okay, and they didn't do that. Gary puts it rather well. He is profiting from from a, a, a status, and we'll put that in inverted commas, built upon the conduct that your callers are describing the effects of, and that that that's the real gristle in the craw, isn't it? That and the fact that, that, you know, important executives as a national broadcaster thought that this was appropriate. Yeah, I, 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 well, I, you'll have a platform here whenever you want one. Thank you, I James. Promise you I that. really appreciate no, it. No, it's, it's absolutely the least I can do. 10.45 is the time. Big clang of this. By the looks of it, but, you know, as, as, as we did allude to earlier, there could be people rubbing their hands with glee at ITV towers, just sort of reflecting upon the brouhaha they've caused. And, the, and the, I mean, that is generally how it works when you're in this business. You kind of derive, or certainly executives, if you're the one in the eye of the storm, it can be a little bit or, or, or profoundly discombobulating. You don't need me to remind you of some horrible stories and, and, and proper tragedies that have unfolded with uh, media personalities being in, in, in the eye of a, of a storm. But the executives, you very rarely know their names. There's nobody here who carries it. Ant and Deck are not going to be tarnished, I don't think, with um, this particular problem. So it, I don't know whether anyone at ITV will be particularly bothered. They might be delighted with all the attention that it's accruing. But just because it's accruing attention doesn't mean you can ignore it. If something bad is going on, you have to talk about it. You have to shine a light on it, even if the people doing the bad stuff are rather enjoying all the attention. It's a tricky one, but it's true. Um, and speaking of doing the bad stuff, I think I just misrepresented the po- population of Japan by approximately 100%. So if you're going to make a mistake, as I always say, make sure it's a big one. population of Japan is not the same as the population of the United Kingdom. It is instead approximately 126 million. Um, almost exactly double the population of the United Kingdom, which, of course, makes those statistics about the fact that their death rate 
um, is, a, is a fraction of ours, a percentage, a tiny percentage of ours. It makes it all the more poignant. And the fact that the man in charge, while we were ra- ratcheted up these sort of death rates, is now behaving like a sort of light entertainment presenter on or performer on national primetime television. It's 10.46. 10.50 is the time. Don't shoot the messenger, but these things do tend to peter out, however angry. I mean, it's really what allowed Boris Johnson to stay in Downing Street for so long. So however angry you are on the Monday, you're going to be less angry by Friday. So however upset we are, and of course in, in the case of people like Fran and my other callers, that their upset is built upon genuine grief and bereavement. So it's going to be much deeper and more profound than the rest of us. But it, it does diminish with time. It's what Johnson relied upon. His entire survival technique was based upon two things. Number one, well, they might be very cross with me today and baying for my blood and calling for my resignation, but they won't. They'll be slightly less cross tomorrow and slightly less cross the day after that and slightly less cross the day after that. And the day after that, there'll be another scandal for them to get cross about. And they'll have forgotten about the one they were so cross about last week. Now, that is Boris Johnson's modus operandi in a nutshell. That's uh, not an opinion. That's simply counting. And uh, Samantha puts this rather well with regards to what role Hancock plays in that process. She says, millions of people suffered profound trauma during the pandemic. I went through cancer treatment on my own because I followed the rules, and I was lucky enough not to lose anyone. Hancock is the embodiment of that trauma. I don't want him to be rehabilitated by TV. And again, we walked that tightrope between the stuff that needed to be done and the stuff that was unavoidable. And I think probably... When, when the books come to be written, when the history comes to be properly told, then Japan is going to play quite a big role in this. Um, we are going to look at a country which is also essentially an island and which has a population twice the size of ours and which is uh, a major world economy and which is a major trader and has a lot of ingress and egress of travel ordinarily and yet which managed to cope with this on a completely different scale a a, a completely better scale and as many people are telling me charlie most recently they continue to masks are still being worn Uh, this summer when i was in japan masks were still being worn by a huge percentage of people even when the temperatures were averaging 37 degrees and no one complained it was all about keeping each other safe and it still is so i don't know that the British people have been well served by the narrative of he got all the big calls right, which, of course, is not just coming from Conservative Party members or Conservative MPs or or, or allies of Boris Johnson. It also comes from journalists, commentators, broadcasters, columnists, who in a normal society you should be able to rely upon to at least point you towards the truth, which is perhaps how they ended up thinking putting Matt Hancock on the programme would be quite a good idea. You know? Well, come on. What's the worst that could happen? You could trigger people who are already grieving in the worst imaginable way. There's one fella on it, I'm told, who doesn't even know who Matt Hancock is. I think we should all just pause for a moment to imagine how lovely that would be. He's in Hollyoaks. Jessica's in Bedford. Jessica, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello. Well, I'd just like, firstly like to make the point I agree with you on about 100% of your politics. I don't think I've found anything I disagree with you yet. <laughs> um, Yikes. And... Um, and then the point that you made that made me call up was the point about, you know, yeah. when at first feeling a bit sort of, you were, I wasn't sure how to feel when um, Matt went in yeah. and the reaction that the other campmates had to him being there. The human side of me made it, me feel a bit uncomfortable. Same. Like, you know, and I feel like that's only natural. I don't think, you know, people that feel that way should be, you know, should feel like there i don't know no it's 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 it's, i'd rather have impulses that veer towards the uh, generous the over generous than impulses that veer towards the over callous i think i I understand what you're saying but some people will be voting in their droves uh, as as often voting often and uh, uh, frequently to get him to do horrible things so essentially to indulge their own schadenfreude and I don't have much of a problem with them either it's a central premise of yeah. the game but I was surprised by how cringy I felt for want of a better word watching him almost being like fattened for market on, on live television or, or live-ish television Yeah, uh, this is the thing and I feel like there's a lot of arguments to be made for various different sort of points and various different people and organisations, like there's an argument we had about ITV and whether it was yes. a good job to, a good idea to put him in there. Ultimately, I think, you know, 
the people that chose to put them in there, they're just doing their jobs at the end of the day. It's not for them, you know, it's for it's the onus fully rests on Matt Hancock for deciding to go in there. Yeah. I feel. I, I, I don't know that I agree with you completely. I don't know that it's a, a zero-sum game. I, I think, you know, they could have said, somebody in the process probably did say, are we sure about this? I mean, they must have done. The casting meetings for these things are absolutely fascinating. It, 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 you know, the, yeah. the, 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 ca- ca- the chats that they have and the comparisons that they make and the things that they predict. And, well, if we're going to have her on, we can't have him on. And if we're going to have him on, then he would be brilliant. I mean, it's quite carefully calibrated, usually. I don't know about the process on I'm a Celebrity specifically, but usually on these sort of shows it's a it's a job you know there's several people working in the casting department on reality television shows and one of them or 10 of them or or, or all of them must have said at some point hang on a minute what about all the people who blame him for the death of their loved ones and 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 then they pressed on well yeah i think i mean at the end of the day if you know it was to come out that those conversations weren't had i feel like you know that would be a very bad look for ITV. Mm. If they had been a, just been a bit ignorant, uh, you know, blissfully ignorant, uh, you know, I feel like maybe, I mean, it, we couldn't maybe get past that, but I don't no, know. I mean, I, I, so I think well, if, if, if I wanted to... The view on the ITV is an yeah. aspect isn't fully formulated, but I think... That's fine. At the end of the day, I think the, the most important thing that has come from this is that we're all, we are all talking about... COVID again. again. We're, well, COVID, COVID specifically. We're talking about political yeah. errors and we're talking about Matt Hancock's role. In, I, I think I agree with you about that. But that would be a fairly, that would be quite a reach for ITV to say, I'm delighted if someone from ITV appeared as, or issued a statement to, to, to this program and said, we are delighted that our plan, like Hannibal Lecter, Hannibal Lecter, Hannibal Smith in the A-team going, I love it when a plan comes together. We are delighted that everybody is once again talking about their grief and, and, and bereavements and Matt Hancock's culpability for the COVID catastrophe. That's the only reason. That is exactly why we put him on the programme. But I, I know you're not suggesting that, Jessica, but, but I, I, you describe a silver lining, which I think we could probably all agree is accidental and, and rather dwarfed, even if it's not accidental by the rest of the crowd. But no, you, you make some excellent points, which I think are important to bear in mind. John's in Warrington. John, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Great Hello, program. Thank First you. time call. A bit oh, nervous here. Well, it's only me. Welcome aboard. <laughs> yeah, um, coming from a um, coal mine town, Labour family, you know, brought up to be against the Tories as it was and yeah. things and all through the PPE scandal. And I was uh, shouting at the TV and, and the briefings every night as people were. Yes. And I've, I've got, I have, I've been touched by COVID deaths and things and I've got all the sympathies of the uh, for the people and uh, who've been on today. But, as you mentioned right from the off, is that I was like, get him dunked, get him in the, you know, the critters and everything else, vote for him and stuff. Yes. Watch this thing every year. And then when he came on, um, same feeling was there. But what I, what I saw is that he looked like the fella who, who goes to every party dressed as something different because he wants to be part of that crowd and how vulnerable he looked and how... I'm glad you used the word vulnerable. I'm no. glad you used the word vulnerable because that, 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 that's the word I should have used. And I don't, I don't, I don't think he should be there. I, I don't think no. he should, you know, I, I think he's a disgrace. I think a lot of what he did during that lockdown was absolutely awful. But I can't enjoy the rinsing of a it's vulnerable when he, when man. He went in the camp and everybody started rolling their eyes and things and I thought... I don't. I'm not comfortable with that. Yeah. that it, it, it's a person at the end of the day. Now, all, all, all things said, you know, I'm not. I'm not trying to sort of gloss over all that. But all things said, it. I just wasn't comfortable with that. And how's that going to play out? Are people going to start being the people they're not? Yeah. In order to sort of, you know. Um, no, it's a bit. It's all a bit. It's all a bit Roman, isn't it? It's all a bit like the yeah. Colosseum, and yeah. and he's he's been served up to be eaten by lions, really, yeah. for the entertainment well, of the British that's, public. That's uh, justifiable, but I'm on a, a human level, not. Particularly I'm with you. Worry. That's how I started the show this morning. Actually, yeah. so I'm slightly surprised to, to 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 feel what I felt. I thought, oh, I don't think I want to watch this. I wouldn't want to watch a. Uh, I wouldn't want to watch a Christian get eaten by well, lions, well, but well, lots of Romans no. did. <laughs> yeah, so I've got eggs <laughs> for animals. But the, the thing is, is that um, one thing is, is that one, one thing I've noticed there, he said about wanting to appear human when he was talking to Charlene and things. Yeah. And I'm sorry, as, as, you know, as a politician and stripping that back. One thing is that when they're briefed and, and they've got all the sort of numbers together, uh, supposedly, uh, they all seem in control and, and um, you know, 
on this pedestal, but yeah. he looked a completely like the bottom of the list last night just looked like a, a Joe public shoved in and out of his depth completely, didn't you think? I did, I did. And and as I say, I'm not going to lie awake at night worrying about him, but I am probably going to watch it rather less than I expected to because I want to keep a very close eye on Moyles. Um, because of that that sense of, of, well, we've nailed it, thanks to John. It, it did feel a little bit like a, a, a Christian being introduced to the Colosseum where either a, you know, a full-on gladiator or a couple of hungry lions... <laughs> are going to do with him what they will. And and uh, listen, thousands of people turned up at the Coliseum to watch that. I'm not suggesting I'm a better person than them. John's not suggesting he's a better person than them. We'd just rather not watch it. Thank you very much. Um, and that's on top of all the other reservations and, 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 and concerns that we've discussed this, this hour. 11 o'clock is the time. Heather Next, one of the very, very few business people you could find a few years ago to come out and tell people that Brexit would be a good idea. Yeah, no prizes for guessing what he's whining about today. Ah! And it's five minutes after 11. Um, I, I, it's last Friday. This is, this is getting quite interesting, isn't it? Last Friday, we broke the seal for the first time in a long time. Uh, I, I, we didn't actually put anything in the tin. I, I think we might have to retire the tin. Otherwise, it might bankrupt me in the coming years. There is a tin, a metaphorical tin, I'll be honest with you, that Keith keeps. And every time I say the words, I told you so, in the context of a conversation about Brexit, I'm required to put a fresh pound coin in the tin. Um, but I don't think we should do that anymore. I, I, I don't think it's funny anymore. I think that subconsciously I felt the need to soften some of the conversations we used to have because I knew there were so many people still listening, clinging to the idea that it was all going brilliantly or that it was all a good idea. I think if you're still clinging to that idea, I can't help you anymore. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't think that there's much prospect of rejoining the European Union anytime soon. I, 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 you know, It is really just a decades-long exercise in damage limitation and whether or not that has to go hand in hand with people pretending that it's all a great idea to impose economic sanctions on ourselves and, and cripple various sectors through lack of employees through lack of staff I don't know and I do care I was about to say I don't care I do care but we can't um we can't do it every day we can't uh, you, you know keep pointing out how well we can keep pointing out how stupid it is but we also have to look at the road ahead we also have to sort of look at the um uh, a, a question of rebuilding and repairing. So you, you were allowed to laugh briefly at somebody called Lord Wolfson. Who were the prominent business advocates of Brexit? I do remember Wolfson, Digby Pudding Jones, not really a business person. He was a sort of provincial solicitor who somehow ended up running the CBI. God knows how, but there we go. Um, he was absolutely adamant that no jobs would be lost. That uh, I, I don't know, was he the one that said the German car industry would be coming? Anyway, thankfully, he seems to have stepped back from the public stage, old, old Digby Pudding Jones. And the, the, the Weatherspoons bloke, he's constantly complaining about the impact of various issues on his business. Let me say again, for the hard of thinking, nobody anywhere claims that every problem the country is facing is a consequence of Brexit. Nobody claims that. In fact, the only people that ever claim that are the Brexiters telling lies about the people who every day mean they wake up feeling stupid. So everyone with a newspaper column, everybody with a, with a platform who was banging on about how brilliant it would be, we'd be better off, the NHS would be better run, schools would be, everything was going to be rosy. They all claim that the people who make them feel stupid now and guilty and ashamed, that, that they claim that we're saying, oh, all our problems are down to Brexit. Nobody's saying that. Not one person. Not one person ever saying all our problems are down to Brexit. Show me a problem and I'll show you how Brexit's made it worse. Show me a problem that Brexit has caused and I'll show you how other things have made it worse. For example, the invasion of Ukraine or the, uh, and the attendant energy crisis, energy cost crisis, or, 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 or the aftermath, obviously, of, of COVID. But, do you know, on the COVID story, there's, a, there's another issue here about the uh, workforce, the re workforce returning to pre-COVID levels that the United Kingdom odd, oddly gets a, little, uh, gets a little look in as well. So... Anyway, I got I distracted myself from my own nonsense then. So you've got the Lord of Weatherspoons, you've got Lord Wolfson, and you've got Dyson. You've got Digby Pudding Jones, who somehow got cast as a business expert, but God knows why. And Stuart Rose at Asda wasn't, was he? I thought he was the leader of Remain. Why have you sent me his name? I could, oh, and the, the JCB guy who keeps paying for Boris Johnson's holidays. He's also currently paying for Boris Johnson's digs. And he kept sending... Uh, um, 
he kept sending him loads of free food during lot. Do you remember that? That fella, Bamford, his name is. So there were business people who thought it would be a good idea. And one of the most prominent was Lord Wolfson. I missed a trick at the top of the last hour. I, I, I should have said up next, next because he is the chairman of Next, the boss of the retailer Next. And he's now urging the government to let more foreign workers into the UK to ease labour shortages. So that this is retail. You know that hospitality have issued a similar plea to the government. You know that agriculture has issued a similar plea to the government. You know that the many health service professionals have issued a similar plea to the government. You know that the veterinarian sector has issued a similar plea to the government. Is there any... Oh, and the hauliers... Well, I think the hauliers were the first out of the blocks, weren't they? Issuing a similar plea to the government. Please let more people into this country from elsewhere in order to ease labour shortages. Um, Lord Wolfson contends that the current immigration policy, you'll remember, we're supposed to celebrate abolishing freedom of movement and Suella Braverman, who's still Home Secretary, is she still Home Secretary? Is Suella Braverman still Home Secretary? Yes, she is, I'm told, still Home Secretary. God only knows how. Um, she's adamant that we need to reduce immigration into this country, while pretty much everybody with a qualification in the sector is adamant that we need to increase it. He also suggests that firms pay a tax to employ foreign workers. Uh, that presumably would include all the firms that said, please don't abolish freedom of movement. It will absolutely cripple our commercial viability. And now they're going to be told they've got to pay a tax in order to get the workers that they begged people like Lord Wilson not to wave goodbye to. Um, uh, and this would, of course, encourage them to recruit from the UK first, which I think we can all agree is, is, is a good thing, a goodish thing. It would be nice if, uh, you know, self-reliance, if you like, even as a, 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 a country fully embracing globalism, self-reliance is not a bad idea. Food reliance, uh, Liz in Cricklade um, was talking to us about this the other day. There's nothing, I mean, imports and exports are great, but if you're growing it yourself, you're less uh, vulnerable to things like Russia invading Ukraine. I, I don't think that that's got any jingoism attached to it or xenophobia attached to it. And similarly, if you are training lots and lots of doctors and nurses, I think Keir Starmer tried to say this the other day in quite a clumsy way, then if, for example, another government comes along and does something really stupid like abolish freedom of movement, then the more doctors and nurses you're training yourself, the better insulated you will be from the impact of the idiocy of a future government that decides to do something stupid like abolish freedom of movement. And that's just one example of something stupid that might happen. You, you, you might have another country offering even more attractive terms to doctors and nurses and drawing them all into their hospitals and health services. So the more people you train in your own country... The, the 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 better insulated you are against the the tidal waves of history what you must never do though is give the people working here who were not born here the impression that they're second class employees or second class doctors or second class nurses it's it's very simply described as integration everybody is working together as a country on a national level we insulate ourselves from international ructions and ripples by growing our own food and training our own doctors and nurses. But we are more than happy to, to import food and to welcome overseas doctors and nurses into our health service as well. There you go. There you go. Write that down. It's not hard, Keir. Honestly, I don't think I can breach what passes for Suella Braverman's intellect with my explanations, however brilliant they may be, and even if I manage to confine them to words of one syllable. But I think that that is a fairly easy thing to explain. We love people who come to this country to help out in our health service and pay taxes and build careers. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We also love training our own doctors and nurses for obvious reasons that shouldn't really need explaining, but in case they do, then just press rewind and play back the last four minutes of this programme. So what are we going to do? Lord Wolfson, a Conservative peer, told the BBC, who almost certainly let him avoid responsibility for helping to cause this catastrophe, given their querulousness and cowardice whenever the word Brexit is being screamed at the radio or the television by everybody intelligent in the country. The BBC continued to pander to the people who either pretend not to understand anything or who genuinely don't understand anything. And, and do remember, please, that everybody knew exactly what they were voting for. It's very condescending to suggest otherwise, so... When Lord Wolfson encouraged people to vote for Brexit, that everybody knew, including him, that it would actually cause the problem that he's now complaining about and describing as um, a crippling effect, having a crippling effect on economic growth. Everybody voted to cripple economic growth. It's very patronising and condescending to suggest otherwise. Sarcasm emoji. Um, he said, 
Uh, it's quite breathtaking, actually. People, get, we've got people queuing up to come to this country to pick crops that are rotting in fields, to work in warehouses that otherwise wouldn't be operable, and we're not letting them in. A bit snobbish, that, because we're also short of doctors, nurses, vets, you name it. Very, very much more qualified sectors as well. We have to take a different approach to economically productive migration. Yeah, we did, mate. It was called freedom of movement of people throughout the largest single market on the planet. That was the approach we had. That was the approach you rejected. Um, he said that the government needed to decide whether the UK was an open, free trading nation. We've literally imposed trading restrictions on ourselves as a consequence of the Brexit you supported, Lord Wolfson. Or whether post-Brexit, Britain wanted to be Fortress Britain, pulling up the drawbridge to foreign workers at significant cost to the economy. Did you attend any pro-Brexit meetings? Lord, did you hear a single syllable uttered by the people you were marching alongside when you were offering up loud public support for this ridiculous idea? That, of course they wanted to be Fortress Britain. They didn't realise what it would mean, but they literally boasted about it. Have you heard of Nigel Farage? Honestly, these people. I think in respect of immigration, it's definitely not the Brexit that I wanted, he says. Just pause a minute now. I'm going to have a sip of tea, all right? Just make sure my voice doesn't creak or crack when I read you the final sentence of this contribution to public discourse, right? Just having a little drink of tea. Don't panic. Don't let the emergency tape kick in. All right, you ready? I think in respect of immigration, it's definitely not the Brexit that I wanted or indeed many of the people who voted Brexit wanted said Lord Wolfson, one of the only prominent business people you could find to offer up support for Brexit when people like Michael Gove were dancing around the place claiming that we'd had enough of experts and Nigel Farage was whipping up vile racist hatred of anybody who couldn't trace their family back to the doomsday book. So there it is. Everybody knew exactly what they were voting for, except a Conservative peer who was a prominent business backer of Brexit. He had no idea what he was voting for because what he got is not what he wanted. How, how, how do you even... How do you even? I've started leaving off the end of my sentences. I'm finding it quite an effective rhetorical flourish. How do you even? I don't know. So what's the question? I'll tell you what the question is. Tell me the truth, all right? Tell me the truth about employment, about staff shortages. Tell me the truth about what's going on. Wherever you are, whatever you do, tell me the truth about the shortage of vets. Whether you work in an abattoir, whether you're a pig farmer or whether you're a vet desperately trying to find some colleagues to help take up the burden of work that you've got. Tell me the truth about haulage. Tell me the truth about hospitality. Tell me the truth about agriculture. Tell me the truth about retail. If we had focused on the truth, there would never have been a Brexit. Some of us tried a bit late. I've got to be honest with you. In my case, I was trying to juggle the impartiality requirements of the BBC, which I think I allowed by a process of insidious osmosis to infect some of my work on LBC at the time. But goodness knows now. Absolutely absurd to still be clinging to the carcass of this. The, 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 the human... The, what would you call him even? I don't know what you'd call him. The sort of penny-farthing-made flesh. Jacob Rees-Mogg has an article in the Daily Telegraph today about why it's really important that we get rid of lots of EU laws. They're still wanging on about it. They're still bleating about, oh, we've got to do this. I mean, this is a man who, when pressed as Minister for Brexit Opportunities, when pressed by the inimitable Rachel Venables on what we might actually do, he talked about signage in the Dartford Tunnel that even the most cursory understanding of the issues would have told him had absolutely nothing to do with European Union membership. The man charged by Boris Johnson with identifying Brexit opportunities ended up talking twaddle about signage in the Dartford Tunnel and still they bleat and whine. So here's the reality. What's it like in your sector trying to find people to do jobs? that you need to be done. Because without people working, there won't be any economic growth. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. And thank you to Jim in Oxford for reminding us of the Leopards Eating People's Faces party, which Lord Wolfson appears to be a fully paid up member of. Um, I didn't think leopards would eat my face, says the man who voted for the Leopards Eating People's Faces party. I didn't think Brexit would be like this, said the man 
who was a prominent supporter of Brexit and now can't find the staff to work in the shops that he needs in order to provide the sort of profits that would drive the sort of economic growth that this country is now crying out for. 18 minutes after 11 is the time. The number you need is 0345 6060 973. Brexit backing next boss says the UK needs more overseas workers. Do you agree? 22 minutes after 11 is the time. These headlines are going to gather pace. They, they, they're, going to, they're going to grow. People like Lord Wolfson won't be touched, really, uh, You know, even if next were to go under as a consequence of the labour shortages that the Brexit he supported has caused. He'll be OK. You won't be seeing him sleeping under Charing Cross Bridge anytime soon. But, you know, everywhere you turn, there are business people complaining about their shortage of staff. And Unemployment, of course, in this country is at record lows. I don't know. It's important always to put your hands up when you um, uh, uh, don't know what's going on. I don't know what happens if the predictions of what's going to happen to unemployment next year and the year after come to fruition. I don't, I don't know what that relationship will be. That will be businesses going bust, I imagine, and therefore people being on the dole, some of whom might be able to find jobs by filling vacancies that other businesses are currently complaining about, but the overall picture will see an increase in unemployment. Uh, that, that's the forecast. But, of course, we're currently governed by people that don't believe in forecasts. Uh, 23 minutes after 11 is the time, but do believe in the crystal ball of mystic mog. Uh, Silka is in Crowthorn. Silka, what would you like to say? Hi, how are you? Very I'm well. sorry if I sound a bit nervous. What? Um, Nothing to be nervous <laughs> about. Okay. Um, I'm actually phoning on behalf of my daughter, who is currently not here, so she can't phone in, but she's a vet nurse. Oh, yes. Um, um, I'm actually German. My husband is Italian. We live in the UK since 2009, and my daughter has been to school here, has done her registration as a vet nurse all in the UK. She's working or has until recently worked as a night nurse oh, in yeah. a hospital. And they, since Brexit, they're struggling to find vets. It's, I mean, even nurses, but vets even more so. And um, they now have to, for years, fly in vets from Italy and France on a regular basis. So these vets, they travel for two weeks, <clears throat> stay for two weeks in this country, then they have to go back to their home country okay. to actually two weeks later to come back to the UK because they can't fill the positions to um, have the night uh, veterinary hospital going otherwise. And, um, I, and, and, and this is, I mean, I suppose it, it's not garnering the attention that it would because, well, reasons, I suppose. Our local vet, this Thomas just sent this, it just had to close down its small animal section completely and scale back its farm and equine yeah, vet yeah. service hugely due entirely to a lack of vets. Why? Well, I mean, I wonder why we're not talking about it more. Well, I mean, my daughter's performing things which, I mean, it's good for her, for her resume as a, as a vet nurse. Yes. Um, I mean, the qualification is really high. I have to say our command, our vet nurses, have never been clapped for during Brexit. But um, they perform things which normally vets are doing at the moment because there's just not, not enough vets around. And um, I think you did mention that the European qualifications throughout Europe, they're incredibly high. And the, the costs to fly in these vets from, from Europe uh, back and forth because they can't stay on a permanent basis is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And, and well, that's controlling our borders, you see. I, I, suppose I presume it is. It, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. None of them ever talk about it. They're all. I mean, Jacob Rees-Mogg is writing articles about why we need. Do you know they found more laws the other day? They 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 didn't even know these laws existed, but they're adamant that they need to be abolished. It's it's, it's like an exercise in public idiocy now, and yet the real people living real lives, doing real jobs of real value, are experiencing what your daughter is experiencing, which is epic <laughs> epic shortages. Well, I mean, and not enough that. I mean, we, I mean, my daughter comes home and she keeps telling me, obviously, <clears throat> she has a bit of a German accent. We all have a bit of a German accent. So, and um, people who, who come as customers or clients with their, their, their pets and, and, and with their horses and whatever, 
they always come say, oh, we're so glad that we have you in this country. Mm. They all seem to be so happy that all these foreign vets and, and nurses are working here. But officially, um, well, they're almost making felt unwelcome. I, well, and that, there it is. So I think probably the people that make you feel unwelcome were given far too much attention and oxygen. Of course, people who should have known better realised they'd never get this ludicrous project over the line without the racist agitation of people like Farage and his mates. But I, I do... Yeah, I, do, I mean... Sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's fine. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, we're here since 2009. We don't have UK passports. Um, we, we had a year of limbo where we said, oh, my God, are we still going to be welcome after that? Or, or should we maybe just sell a house and just move to God. Italy or Germany? No. Um, well, you'd, I mean, you won't need to. Uh, for, 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 well, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. It's, it's, you're not going to be chased out of the country, but we may have made it a less attractive proposition um, for you. I, I, again, I've got a touch of the Matt Hancocks on this because I do have sympathy for people that Lord Wilson describes as not getting the Brexit that they wanted or, or, or that they voted for. I don't know what that was. What was it you were voting for or hoping for if it didn't involve reducing the number of people coming here from overseas? It was such a huge part of the conversation. In many ways, the only part of the conversation that I do, I do struggle to work out precisely who Lord Wilson is talking about. Although there are one or two prominent pro-Brexit faces who were adamant from the start that they didn't want to affect immigration, then you sort of wonder what they did want to affect. Silke, thank you. 28 after 11 is the time. Simon's in Bournemouth. Simon, what would you like to say? Well, I, I would like to say there's, <clears throat> within the, the housing sector, it's, it's very difficult to get um, decent construction workers. We mm. used to get um, French workers coming over because there was freedom of movement and uh, they could supply a lot of the workforce. Now, French. obviously, because of Brexit, we can't. Yes, yes I have not heard they, that they, before. They, I mean, I'm they, familiar with the Eastern European workforce that we benefited from enormously, but I, yes. I haven't heard the French builders cited we, previously. Well, well, the, the, the French used to come over and they used to build um, a housing estate in, in, in Southampton. The Gosh. only problem was, was that when, the, when there was a match, match in Parc de France in, in Paris, they would disappear. But <laughs> then we would get them back. That's, that's only, it's but, only a few games you, a year, isn't it? Just, what, you asked me what, bre- what kind of Brexit I'd imagined. Well, yes. I was told that we would get the Norway solution. Who, who told be, you that? Well, all, co- colleagues, at, colleagues at work who oh. were kind of pro, pro-Marine... And, and to be perfectly honest, that's what I thought MPs would go for, mm. so that we would have have all the um, benef- benefits, but we wouldn't be part of the political European Parliament. Yeah, except that we would be compelled to abide by all the legislation handed down by the Parliament that we were no longer in. Well, so, is there anything wrong with that? Well, I don't think there is. But if you, I mean, you put me in a slightly uncomfortable position, Simon. I don't want to be rude. But, I mean, quite how you could have followed the Brexit debate without registering the weight of opinion that was very simply anti-foreigner and the weight of opinion that was very simply anti-following European Union laws at a time when we did have a large say in what they would be. The idea that you'd get a Brexit through that didn't reduce the number of foreigners coming to this country and compelled us to continue following European laws while we no longer had any say in making them was, dare I say, a trifle pie in the sky well i i did think mps would be a little bit more more sensible and come through to a practical solution yeah. after the uh, result but that's just mine my no opinion. and I, I i i actually respect that position and i think without the the, the inflation of boris johnson they might have done of course uh, theresa may a uh, second attempt to get her deal through it, 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 i said at the time that even if i was a um a member of parliament, I'd have voted for Theresa May's second deal because by the time it came around, you realised how wrong Simon was, uh, expecting MPs to behave in a vaguely sensible way or a vaguely rational way. You realise what the alternative was. The alternative was more lies, more nonsense, the sort of Reese Moggy and Johnsonian cult, utterly denying and defying reality. And although staying in the European Union would have been the best available option, that was off the table and the alternative was to veer well you've seen what the alternative was because we're all living it now a Theresa May's deal which would have solved the problem in Northern Ireland and solved a lot of the issues that we're discussing now would, would actually have worked albeit that it would have been inferior to what we already have cutting your losses I think it was called uh, 31 minutes after 11 is the time Holly Harris is here with the headlines 
36 minutes after 11 is the time. I, I, I mean, you know, we're going to have to do this. I, 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 did, I did. It was brought to my attention that people, one or two people, had actually started. So we've got to stop talking about Brexit. That didn't last very long because, of course, the people talking about it now are the people that called for it. In this case, Lord Wolfson, a Conservative peer, saying that essentially our post-Brexit immigration policy is crippling economic growth. Quel surprise, as the French say. Um, we may return to that topic. I've got Mystery Hour on the way. I've got a very exciting new book to, 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 to tell you about coming up in, uh, in about 10 minutes' time. If you like SAS stuff, and frankly, who doesn't? This, this book, I think, is going to put quite, quite a cat among the pigeons. And then, of course, it's Mystery Hour from 12. It's crept up on us this week, hasn't it, Thursday? A bit partridgey. Like, well, it's crept up on me. I don't know why. So we'll be getting stuck in on Mystery Hour. And I've got some exciting news about the board game as well. A pal of mine has identified a way to play it with younger children, which does not involve the uh, imagination that is necessary to play it with grown-ups. So that's another reason why you should have it in your Christmas stocking or indeed under your tree uh, this year. So we'll be sh talking about that a little later. Before that, much more importantly, Rachel, Gren Gr Rachel Venables has been keeping an eye, as always, upon events at the Grenfell Inquiry and is here with, with another update. Well, it's the final one for a while, James, because today is the final day of the Grenfell Inquiry. And I thought given the momentous nature mm. of this moment and, of course, the way we have covered it on this programme every twist and turn uh, for four years now, I should bring you some of the closing words from Sir Richard Millett, KC. Now, he's the lead counsel. He's the head lawyer for the inquiry. He's the man who's been quizzing and examining the many witnesses over the past four years. You'll have heard him countless times uh, coming back with questions, those cutting remarks to the many people who've been giving evidence and sitting in that room in West London. So he's the advocate in a way for the for the victims and the families and it, the, uh, the He's the, the one trying to get the answers. Pursuing the truth. Presenting them yes. to the chair, who will then go away now, uh, Sir Martin Morbick, with his panel, look at all the evidence and write up that final report. Uh, and really, he started this morning with his summing up just before 11 o'clock by reminding the chair, Sir Martin Morbick, of the huge mountain of evidence to date, everything he's got to sift through, and that all-important, crucial need to give victims the answers that they want. Have a listen. Each and every one of the risks which eventuated at Grenfell Tower on that night were well known by many and ought to have been known by all who had any part to play. As a result, you will be able to conclude with confidence that each and every one of the deaths that occurred in Grenfell Tower on the 14th of June 2017 was avoidable. The reasons were many, complex, and in many cases, inextricably interlinked. Some had an immediately causative effect and others less so. It is open to you on the evidence to conclude that there was a long run-up of incompetence and poor practices in the construction industry and the fire engineering and architects profession, weak and incompetent building control, cynical and possibly even dishonest practices in the cladding and insulation materials manufacturing sector, incompetence, weakness and malpractice by those responsible for testing and certifying those materials, the failure of central government to act despite known risks, failures of competence, training and oversight within the TMO and over it by RBKC, a failure by the LFB to learn the lessons of Lacknell and other fires, and to train its operational staff to collect, understand, and to act on the risks presented by modern construction methods and materials, risks well known to some, but not all, within that institution. It's 20 to 12. Um, I'm going to play you that again, actually, with Rachel's permission, because I know how it works. You know, I, I'm guilty of it myself as well. I've got one eye on this and another eye on that. And Rachel comes into the studio and I mentioned Mystery Hours coming up and we've got the phone in underway about Brexit job shortages and we've got the, the, the Matt Hancock stuff still popping up in my inbox. And it's easy to get distracted. It's easy not to notice. And very rarely, I think, it falls to me to recognise that we really need to be paying a lot more attention to this, not least because... Many other corners of the media have rather taken their eye away from the events of that dreadful night and the and the now concluded or concluding inquiry into it. So 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 listen once again to Richard Millet K C on the final day of the of the Grenfell Tower inquiry. 
Each and every one of the risks which eventuated at Grenfell Tower on that night were well known by many and ought to have been known by all who had any part to play. As a result, you will be able to conclude with confidence that each and every one of the deaths that occurred in Grenfell Tower on the 14th of June 2017 was avoidable. The reasons were many, complex, and in many cases, inextricably interlinked. Some had an immediately causative effect, and others less so. It is open to you, on the evidence, to conclude that there was a long run-up of incompetence and poor practices in the construction industry and the fire engineering and architect's profession, weak and incompetent building control, cynical and possibly even dishonest practices in the cladding and insulation materials manufacturing sector, incompetence, weakness and malpractice by those responsible for testing and certifying those materials, the failure of central government to act despite known risks, failures of competence, training and oversight within the TMO and over it by RBKC, a failure by the LFB to learn the lessons of Lacknell and other fires and to train its operational staff to collect, understand and to act on the risks presented by modern construction methods and materials, risks well known to some but not all within that institution. Just a, 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 a brief reminder, because we've mentioned him a couple of times on the programme today, that um, in contrast to that analysis and description from Richard Millet Casey, Jacob Rees-Mogg, of course, believed that all of the people who died that night did so because they lacked common sense. Back to you, Rachel. I've got one more clip for you, James, um, in a very similar vein. Yesterday, you'll remember, I played you a little of some of the closing remarks. We were hearing from lawyers representing the victims. Uh, we also heard yesterday from the council. They did offer a full apology to those who lived in the tower, those who lost loved ones. Uh, but we also heard from some of the lawyers representing the various companies. Yes. And I played you, you'll remember, um, a clip from uh, the lawyers representing the cladding and insulation companies. And in that moment, in those final moments, when lawyers for the victims had demanded people come forward and apologise. You had the likes of Kingspan, who made the insulation blaming Arconic. They made the cladding Arconic blaming Kingspan. And the phrase that has come up a lot this week is the merry-go-round of buck passing. It's something that came up right at the start of the inquiry, we've been reminded. And so Richard Millett KC decided quite powerfully, I think, in this final moment to make some really sharp remarks about the level of contrition I should say, actually, the lack of contrition mm. that he thinks he's seen and culpability from many of those who've been involved, who've given evidence these past few years. Listening to the last three and a half days of overarching closing statements from a range of core participants, if everything that has been said is correct, then nobody was to blame for the Grenfell Tower fire. Can that really be right? Is the answer that you are to give to the survivors, to the grieving families, and to the wider public to be that the Grenfell Tower fire was just a terrible accident, just one of those unfortunate incidents that happen occasionally? Or is it to be that there are so many to blame that no one individual or organisation shoulders very much blame? Is that the answer that these core participants taken collectively would urge upon you? And if they do, are they really as sorry as they say. When I opened this inquiry as counsel, as Mr. Adrian Williamson, King's counsel, has now reminded you, and others since, I told you that all the indications were to be that some, at least, of the core participants would indulge in what I termed a merry-go-round of buck passing. I had hoped that my task, and so your task in turn, would be made easier by candid admission of blame. Some core participants, principally public bodies, have made carefully expressed admissions of specific fault. My metaphor may now have become rather worn, particularly this week, but for many, even now, on day 312 of this phase of this inquiry, the merry-go-round turns still, the notes of its melody clearly audible in the last few days. Wow. Lyrical, almost, mm. but but with purpose. Yeah, and to the point. And uh, he then proceeded 
and I think he may still be going on right now, but I wanted to play you these two moments uh, to go through a lot of the evidence, which is the point now. I don't quite know how long he's going to talk for today, mm. whether it's a few more minutes or hours. We'll catch up tomorrow, but at we? the I can do, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of it, as I say, this, will, this part of the inquiry will be over. And that's the job of Sir Martin Morbick to go away and to write his report and to come up with his recommendations. Any indication of how long that might take? We're expecting it to be the end of 2023. Gosh. So another 12 months or so. It's, yes. a, it's a big job and it's a long wait. It was a really difficult long wait for the survivors who've waited so long already. And it is, again, to, to bring it back to that ludicrous Somerset MP, it, it is... Today, as as Richard Millet lists all of those failures and and avoidable causes of deaths that Rhys Mogg chooses to write in the Daily Telegraph about why we need to get rid of even more regulations and why health and safety legislation is unnecessary. I make no apology for juxtaposing those two um, stories because if, if, if nobody does point out the absurdity of these positions then we could have another tragedy on our hands as a direct consequence of reducing the regulation and health and safety legislation that's currently in place. Rachel we'll see you again tomorrow. Yep. Thank you very much indeed. It's 11.47. It's 11.51 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. It's uh, Mystery Hour T minus nine minutes. Mystery Hour with us at 12 and, and goodness knows we could do with a giggle this week. Before that, I've got an amazing story to share with you, a story that has never been told before. Um, but let me give you a quick bit of context. I, 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 I did, contrary to cliches and popular belief, as a, as a member of the liberal media, I do not spend a lot of time at dinner parties in North London. In fact, I've only ever been to one. Um, and it didn't go well. But I do occasionally have lunch with my publisher, which I appreciate is a, a slightly um, full-of-yourself turn of phrase but uh, and he tells me about the other books that he's publishing and i often drift off because you know i i I'm really so self-obsessed i'm only really interested in projects that involve me but every now and then he mentions a book and my little ears prick up and i think flipping heck now that really does sound interesting and the book that i've got in front of me now speed aggression surprise the untold secret origins of the sas by um, a former SAS commander, now an award-winning filmmaker called Tom Petch, is absolutely in that category. And Tom is with me. I, I we, we, we share a publisher, obviously. I didn't believe him when he told me some of the details that you were going to share in this story. I, yeah. Because, but, well, yeah. for two reasons. Number one, if you had to invent an alternative history of the SAS to challenge the one about Sir David Sterling, um, mm. you know, recruiting a plucky group of renegades, as you write in the introduction, and forging a special forces unit in the cauldron of the Western desert, then y you'd struggle to come up with one as contrasting as, as, as the one that you tell in that, this story. That's, that's very true, James. Yeah, it would, it <laughs> And the second reason, how has come this has never come out before? I think, well, to, to cover the alternative history, you know, what I've done is go back a bit. So yes. everyone starts with Sir David Sterling, and he is the founder of the SAS. But, but what always got me about that story is it started a long time before. And if you start at the beginning of the war, you start with a character called Dudley Clark. And he was a British staff officer in his 40s, not a member of the SAS, not on the front line. And he just worked out that we couldn't beat the Germans, basically. And he came up with special forces and what he calls subliminal methods, methods of deception, to mess with the Germans, to mess with Hitler and Mussolini. And he was very successful. But the problem with his success was after the war, we obviously went straight into the Cold War mm. and the Russians and Berlin Wall came and everyone thought we're going to use these techniques again. And so they became secret. And so his stuff was all classified. In fact, his last mission was only declassified in 2000. Gosh. So, but if you look at There's modern... almost, of, I mean, in the context of recognition he was almost a victim of his own success he was i think i think dudley clark would be the SAS's alan turing you know the guy yes. who broke the enigma code so in the 70s the enigma code was was declassified and everyone went back to the history books and they went hang on we knew what the german we were reading the german's mail you know wow. like, and here you've got clark so you know everyone starts with this this story where and, and it's not wrong the story about sterling's not wrong you know he is the founder of the actual unit but you've got to go back a bit to understand why the SS even came into being, and that is Dudley Clark. Because the idea, in fact, with the benefit of hindsight, that the, the, the idea that you could sort of start a unit, um, I think the phrase you use is from the bottom up, yeah, is actually yeah. unfeasible. Yeah, so there's, yeah, that's, that's the thing, because obviously I was a lieutenant in the army, you know, it's a bit like working for a big corporation, you don't get in to see the managing director, and he goes, hey, you know, David, start a, start a regiment, you know, that's, that, that's <laughs> yeah. not a... 
that's not something that's never going to happen. So you, you knew in the narrative there was this problem, and it's hinted at very early on. In fact, one of the first books, which is called Phantom Major mm. by Virginia Cowles, is a very good war correspondent. She hints, she mentions Clark. She says, you know, when he gets commissioned to start the SAS, the commanding officer shakes his hand and goes, you know, whatever happens to your mission, you know, it'll greatly relieve Clark's burden. So they knew. And Sterling does credit him himself, but he can't tell the story. He, he wasn't allowed to. So it all remained undercover. And there's another character as well who essentially was the most effective uh, advocate of Clark's ideas. Yes, William Fraser, yes. So that's another thing um, about the regiment. You know, so of the, of the sort of former members of the regiment, you have Sterling, Maine and Lewis. Everyone knows about them. Mm. But there was a former corporal, and this is really the reason he doesn't get much credit. He's a former corporal. His name was William Fraser. He, he joined the commandos as an officer. He then became the most successful SAS officer of the war. You know, he, he led them into North Africa, Italy, France. Uh, but he, wasn't, he was from the ranks. So he wasn't part of that aristocratic, university-educated band of officers that everyone looks at and goes, OK, that, those were the guys. The so officer was, class. Yeah, the officer class. He was from outside that. He had an emergency commission. And, and also he was gay. Ah. So at a time when... That was frowned on and illegal, not only in the army, but in the wider wider. Yes. He, he didn't want to publicise anything. He went into obscurity after the war, never wrote a biography, never never, never publicised what he'd done. And, and I, I think for that reason, he doesn't get enough credit. Yeah. Did he, I mean, did he lead a, a fulfilled life after the war? Did he? No, sadly, I no. think the war, I write this at the end of the book, actually, I don't sort of pull any punches about what no. happens to these guys. I think after the war, he, what he saw and that war was brutal. And if you operated behind the lines in that war and saw what he'd seen, it, it, you came out damaged. Yeah. There's no nice... And I mean, you didn't get the care that you deserved no, and needed, no, no, clearly. No. But he wasn't... I mean, it... it well, I, and then I'll come to the other bit. I understand now why both of them have, have not had their stories told before. How did you get onto the trail? I always, well, I always knew about the bit about Sterling in the office. So I didn't know any of this when I was in the military, you know, right. I, you know in the military, you just wander around. Like, I, I actually was started getting a bit in, interested in military, history, like you would when you're in the military to yeah. find out what had happened. Yeah. And, and that story about Clark in the office, I knew that story. Uh, and it wasn't until I started looking into the archive. And I think what I, the advantage I might have had was because I'd been in the military, the military speaks in code. I don't mean literal enigma code. No. It, it speaks in subtext. No one writes exactly what they mean. Right. And understanding all those abbreviations, all the different headquarters, I started to, it was like a jigsaw. I started yeah. to go, this doesn't make any sense. So that was the other thing I discovered, was British High Command were not only trying to create special forces in the SAS, they, they were then operating it as part of a wider plan. So Sterling wasn't out in the desert by himself. No. He was linked directly to the force headquarters, and they were directing his actions. And you only get that, I think, if you've been in the military. I, 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 was there a single point then where you felt the lights come, where you thought, flipping out, this is a story that needs to be told? Or was it a cumulative effect? It was, I think, that's, that's really interesting. I remember going into the Imperial War Museum and finding Clark's original files, which wow. were in three boxes, and going, wow. oh, I'm like, oh, I have to swear on the shot. I don't know. I was like, oh, bother. Oh, bother. <laughs> no one's got this. And I suddenly went, and it's all loose leaf paperwork. And I went, oh, wow. And you start flicking through it and going, this is, and that, I don't know, who's, I don't think people have been through that. No. Uh, well, since, since it was stuck since in a box. Since it was stuck in a box. And 50 the, years uh, yeah, and one more. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone's looked at it. So wow. I got that archive. That was one moment. And the other moment was actually William Fraser, because, you know, the, the SS wasn't doing very well. You know, right. it wasn't. It, it had a parachute operation, was a disaster. Fraser luckily missed that because he'd broken his arm. He goes out to the desert, picks them up. And then they basically don't really, you know, Without, you know, Sterling, Maine and Lewis launched this raid, which goes wrong because their job's to knock out air aircraft, which they don't do. They come back and they've, they've got empty, you know, empty hands and they then send Fraser out to do this raid that he, he, he knocks out 37 aircraft. And that was the one that all the headquarters went, oh, wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. They all sat up and listened. They went, wow, what's this? You just knocked out 37 aircraft with five men. That was the one. And that was the other kind of eureka moment. Hang on. I thought I knew this story. But actually, but actually, I didn't. Actually, I didn't. It's an origin. I mean, to, to use the language of Marvel films, and it, it's an origin that's, story. That's why everyone gets fascinated by yeah. this. It's secret. Yeah, it, you know, yeah. It's, it's a it's, proper yeah. origin. I mean, it is. And yeah. let's start actually briefly. Uh, we mentioned that William Fraser was gay, but Dudley Clark was also um, 
living a, a life that would have been rather hard. To... Yeah. So uh, if you've if you've seen uh, that TV series, he he can't, Dominic West plays in the yes. TV series, and he, in the first scene, he's, he comes in on in a dress, and he he was a cross dresser, and 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 we know that. <laughs> this is what I meant about yeah. the story being quite. Yeah. So the SS was found to... by someone who was a gay man, a cross dresser. Well, yeah, you couldn't make that. Up. But but no. but the thing is, we know he was a cross dresser because he used to go undercover in a dress. Right. Uh, and we know that he did that because he got picked up by the Spanish police in Spain running a massive deception operation uh, for a British attack. And I think what he'd worked out was the one, if you were in a dress in a cabaret bar, yeah. no one's going to think you're a British officer. <laughs> like, no one. <laughs> That's a reasonable he, he, conclusion. No, and he recruited more double agents. He, he ran these massive deceptions. And I think from Istanbul, Berlin before the war, Madrid, Estoril in Portugal, he was wearing a dress. He, he was, when he was picked up, he had two sets of well-fitting women's clothes. It's an astonishing story, isn't it? I mean, mm. you, we haven't even mentioned your great-great-granddad. Yeah, yeah. So he... We're all late for the news, so keep it okay, brief. Okay, brief. Yeah, That's so how my, good the book is. Yeah, yeah, great-great-grandfather. So he founded Shepherd's Hotel Cairo, uh, where they all met. That was the kind of party town where they all got together. Um, Speed Aggression Surprise by, by Tom Petch is, is, is out now. It's in, it's in all good bookshops and probably mediocre ones as well, published by WH... Alan, um, and it is a, it's a work of epic scholarship as well. It's it's you know absolutely annotated and indexed, but the the story is so phenomenal that um, even if it wasn't a work of epic scholarship, it would be garnering a, a lot of eyeballs. I think it's incredible. Thank you, Tom. Thanks very much. No, and congratulations as well. Yeah, it's so wonderful you. to have your first book out. Yeah, thanks. Um, two minutes after twelve is the time. You can find that, as I say, "Speed Aggression Surprise" by Tom Patch wherever you buy your books. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation, Mystery Hour with James O'Brien. Oh, I, I really, I know I don't normally do this at the top of Mystery Hour, nod back to the last thing we did in the programme proper, but this book is, is I, I mean, crikey, if you've got anyone in your life who enjoys stories about the military or the SAS in particular, this has got to be at the top of your Christmas list. Um, and of course, if you've got anyone who enjoys board games, well, I'll get on to that in a moment. Because Mystery Hour is upon us, your weekly opportunity to achieve the sort of satisfaction not ordinarily available anywhere else on your radio. Um, we provide illumination. We provide uh, education. Edification. Edification, do you think? Edifica illumination, education, edification. Any other Asians? There's no vacation. But, um... It's a celebration of knowledge. It's a ce celebration of enlightenment, because what we do is find out what you know, not what you can find out. It's quite an old person's premise, this, because when we were growing up, you couldn't just Google everything. You had to actually memorize stuff and learn it and know it, and then drag it up when needed. And that's what Mystery Hour is. Someone asks a question, and someone else provides an answer. But it's an answer that will be built upon the journey you have taken through life. It may be a, a spectacularly banal junction in that journey. You may know what you know because you saw it on the telly last night. But equally, you may know what you know because of a curious turn your life took 20 years ago when you found yourself working on the bridge of an oil tanker or designing toasters in Macclesfield or becoming the professor of the public understanding of science at the University of Brighton as one of our most regular contributors has. Do you see what I mean? So that's why I ask what your qualifications are. So how do you know what you know? I don't mean you've got a cycling proficiency from... Starport Police Station in 1983 or, or that you've got a Bag of Gymnastics Award for or anything like that or a degree although the degree might be relevant of course to why you know what you know but it could be something completely strange or it could be utterly breathtakingly relevant so I said well how on earth do you know that and you say well actually I invented it in which case you'll almost certainly get a Ray Liotta which is the largest highest greatest accolade that can be bestowed upon any listener to any radio program anywhere in the world Seven minutes after 12 is the time. Um, there is also a prize this week, and last week, and next week. And that prize is a copy of the Mystery Hour board game, which is brilliant, I have to say. I don't actually think, I know I mention it every week, but I don't think I actually stress what a fantastic game it is. And with Christmas now on the horizon, I allow me to take a moment to tell you how it works. So what, what has been over the years one of the best things about Mystery Hour is that, oddly enough, the wrong answers... Uh, or the plausible answers that are, actually, it turns out, not correct, or the ones that are built on urban myths. So what you get on Mystery Hour, you get, you get a board game. Um, oh, yeah, as Keith says, my answers. that They feature quite heavily, my wrong answers. So what you get with the board game is a card with a question on it, 
And then there is a choice of two questions, two answers, one of which is correct and one of which is not correct, but has probably popped up on the programme when the question did. But then there's the third option, which is where the game really uh, uh, achieves a quite a special status, which is you can make up an answer in the here and now. So you take a few minutes at the beginning of the game to go through your cards and look at what your questions are. And what, what I advise you do is jot down the bones of the fake answer you're providing so that, so that it looks like you're reading it off the card. Do you see what I mean? Now, it, people get quite serious and sly playing board games, as you know, especially families. So it's important that you don't give any clues as to which one is the made-up question because that's the only one that isn't written down in advance before you deal the cards. So you, 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 you can put the... Um, you can put the, 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 the fake question in any order. There's two fake questions, one of which you made up and one of which we provide in the game. And then everybody else has to guess what the correct answer is. Some people might know, of course. That's allowed as well. You get rewarded for your knowledge. The more you've listened to Mystery Hour, the better you will do in the game. And in fact, the more you've listened to it, the better you will be at coming up with the fake answers. Because if someone picks your fake answer as the right answer, you get double points. That's, that's, that's really what you're going for. The real pay dirt comes when your fake answer is so convincing and so persuasive that lots of people play and vote for it. And that is how you really win. You're much better off coming up with better fake answers than you are with getting the correct answer to somebody else's question. And then my friend Scott he told me last night his daughter brought it downstairs and asked if she could play. And I'm reading this message from him and I'm quite touched. I'm thinking, that's lovely. And he goes, I thought you'd like to know this, James. He goes, so I asked her, why do you want to play that game, darling? Thinking that she'd say something like, oh, it's got James on the box or it's nice and he's your friend. He said, it's the only one I could reach in the cupboard, Dad, she said. So thanks for that. Um, but they've discovered a way with a six-year-old that you can play the game as well because obviously the six-year-old's not going to be able to come up with fake answers. So you just ignore the third option. You've got the card, the correct answer and the wrong answer and you just guess or, 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 or work out which is the right answer and the wrong answer. That's not even in the instructions. That's, that, that, that's Scott's little variation on the game for younger players. So it's all there and, and you can get hold of it at mysteryhour.co.uk or in John Lewis. Um, it doesn't feature in the advert, I'm afraid. I, I, I thought it might. I thought it might get an appearance in the new Christmas advert, but it doesn't. Doesn't get. Doesn't get. No, no products do. To be fair, it's beautifully moving. It made me cry this morning. That advert. If you haven't seen it yet, I think it's probably on the LBC website. If you want to go and have a look. Um, uh, that, there it is. So you, you can get it from mysteryad.co.uk directly, or you can get it from Amazon, of course, and, and, and you can get it also from, from John Lewis. But with Christmas on the way, I thought I'd just give you a quick heads up on what it's all about, because I know some people still think it's a pretend. They don't think Keith is a real person. They don't think the board game is a real product, but it is, and now you know. And whoever makes the best contribution to today's programme, to today's Mystery Hour, will win their own Mystery Hour board game. I can't say fairer than that. The terms and conditions can be found at lbc.co.uk. It is 11 minutes after 12. Let's kick things off. Gary's in Hass Hassocks. Gary, question or answer? Good afternoon. I've got a question about airport security, which has been driving me crazy for a long, long time. Yes. Um, my wife has, when we go through airport security, she has a plastic bag. Inside that is four or five hundred milliliter bottles of lotions and potions and creams. I don't know what she takes. Yeah. So the question is, why are you allowed to have all those small bottles of liquid, but you can't take a big bottle, like a bottle of Coke or a bottle of water? I think I know this. I thought you might. Well, I'm Go sorry, on. I know. but I, I, I'm hoping it's not connected to the profit airport shops make on selling bottled water. No, it, well, I mean, it was in its first instance, and it's in the, and at the point of its introduction, it was clearly a security measure, and, and, and I'm yeah, pretty oh, sure course. it remains yeah. so. But if you've got a hazardous liquid... Then, and you and you and you have nefarious intent. So let's, for the sake of argument, say that you've got something corrosive that you're going to use to do bad stuff. Yeah. If you've got five hundred and you need, let's say, half a liter of it to make an impact on on whatever it is that you have nefarious intent towards. If you've got to empty out five little bottles in order to get the corrosive liquid or the acid deployed in a nasty way. You're not going to get. You're not going to be able to do it, are you? You're going to get. You're going to get. But you punched. are because you just buy a. You buy a bottle in an airport shop and empty your little bottles. Yeah, into but the they're going to spot that, mate, aren't they? 
Not if you go into the bathroom and do it. Well, well, I mean, really, someone's carrying in one bottle, one big bottle and five little bottles into the bathroom. I mean, there are ways around this. There's ways around all security measures. But the question of why they have that security measure in place is, if you prefer, to make it much, much harder to have a, a half a litre of corrosive liquid. Well, I presume this is the answer. I'm not, I'm not going to give myself a round of applause. Don't worry. I, I, I don't know. I, I think if you've got corrosive liquid, 100 millilitres could do a lot of damage. Yeah, but not as much as a litre could. If you got which is your question. Bottles, which is, yeah, I know, I know. I'm not claiming it's foolproof. I'm just, <laughs> I mean, what do you think the reason is? I, I don't know. Well, I've just given that, you an answer. One, Who are you picking holes in my answer when you haven't got one of your own? <laughs> I think I, I think they're hanging on to the they sell bottled water in the airports. At yeah, but that's no. The question is about why it was introduced, not why. Um... No, yeah, why it was introduced initially. I think I don't think you were allowed to take any liquids initially mm. in your hand luggage. And then they, they bought in no, the right. litre limit. Yeah, that's right. But I, I, well, we'll find out. Someone will know this. It's a great question, actually. I'm surprised we haven't done it before. But I, I'd, be, I'd be slightly surprised if it's not, if my answer isn't close to correct. Um, although quite often when I have the cockiness to say something like that out loud i end up being served up with a fat slice of humble pie before close of play thank you gary so the the little bottles on the planes um why given that well you heard what gary said there's, there's lots of ways you could get around the um the f- forbidding or the or the outlawing of the big bottles of liquid you could pour lots of little the contents of lots of little bottles into a big bottle um for special for rosalyn is this could you please repeat on air the name of the book you just interviewed the author about i just couldn't catch the name i can indeed it's speed aggression surprise easy to remember rosalyn sas by tom patch uh which should be second on everybody's christmas list after the mystery our board game mystery hour on lbc with james o'brien 18 minutes after 12 is the time. Let's crack on uh, and, and get some more questions on the board as quickly as possible. Charlie's in Nottingham. Charlie, question or answer? Uh, good afternoon, James. It's a uh, question, please. Carry on, Charlie. Um, so I had a call the other day and I was sniffing uh, honey and lemon in hot water. Um, and I'm just wondering, why can you sniff, why can you smell things when you breathe th- in through your nose, mm. but then you can't smell them when you breathe out through your nose? What do you mean? What? Uh, what? But because the because the because your olfactory senses are in your nose, so you're drawing the. I've met, I think I may have misunderstood you, but you, the thing what you smell is being yeah. drawn into your nose when you breathe in, and the thing what you would smell is being blown away from your nose when you breathe out. But is it is it, are those receptors directional though, or well, they're, in, the they're, in the they're in your nose? They're in they're in your nose. Yeah. So, what if you breathe out of your nose, though? You mean the few? You mean that? What? What? But what are you breathing out of your nose? Well, you're breathing out the same thing that you breathed in, surely. Oh, I see what you mean. Ah, oh, okay. Is it a stupid question? <laughs> no, it's not. I don't think it is a stupid question. I, I think I'm being a bit slow on the uptake, which happens occasionally. So you breathe in. <laughs> Through your nose, and you get the aroma of. Did you really only have lemon and honey? You didn't have a little little tot of something else in there just to take the edge, because it's not a hot toddy, that is it? That's just a sort of. Usually, it's put, just something that my mum's always done. So yeah, but does I'm she not put of... a shot of Jameson's in there or something like that? <laughs> she might do, but she didn't do that when I was a kid, so that's not what I've learned to do. <laughs> no, fair enough. And so you're breathing it in, and it's quite a pungent. It's a nice smell. You've got the honey and lemon, and then when you breathe yeah. out, you think, in a sense, you're still. I, you can't. You're not. All right, yeah. It's not a stupid question. Well, I don't think it is. It's it, not related to having a cold either, because what, on, after the cold's gone recently, I've, I've been able to just I'd do the same thing, and I, I still can't smell breathing out. No, hang on. I've got, I've got something here, actually. I've got one of my smoothies here. Wait there. I'll just test it for you. I put all sorts in it this morning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm not expecting to be able to smell anything when I breathe out. But that's not an answer to the question of why I can't, is it? No, this, this uh, it's just it's just niggling in the back of my brain. No, this is the only reason I'm yeah, asking. Yeah, why does the, why does whatever it is you smell not pass over whatever it is in your nose on the way out in the same way that it does on the way in or or, or something? Thank you, Charlie. Stay safe. It is. I might just have a sip of that actually while Mark is telling me whether he has a question or an answer. Hello, hello, James. I was going to have a sip myself with some coffee, but that's another thing. Um, right, oh, it's a question. 
Yes. The question. A question. Um, the question is, I was driving back across France um, a couple of weeks ago, middle of the night, friend in the passenger seat, fantastic drive, trying to keep awake and listening to some really cool music, early 80s, electric stuff. Yeah, it was, uh, cool beans. What, yeah, Giorgio simple... Moroder, what was it? No, 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 no. It was uh, a Simple Minds, New Gold Dream, 81, 82, 83, 84. Bro, fantastic. And you get that kind of like the shiver down the spine and the goosebumps. I said to my friends, I said, mate, do you get that? Do you get the kind of, the, yeah. that's such an amazing piece of music. And he looked at me and go, hey, are you from another planet? <laughs> Tingles. And I kind of went, you don't know, you just uh, did not understand that. Well, with a, any, with any music that? ever, with any, or not just, they just got different tastes no, to you. No, it's, it's just some tracks that, you know, you could like, I don't know, Ultravox or something, Vienna and stuff like that, or just lovely pieces of classical music. And then, you know, not everything, and then you'll get this kind of like the, the tingle down. No, I get it. I know what it is. I, but I, I mean, yeah. does your mate not get it with anything? Correct. He does right. not get it with anything. So the and question is, is why do some of us get goosebumps listening to music, but other people don't? Absolutely it's correct. a great question. I presume, you presume banana. everybody would, wouldn't you, if you do? I do. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The list of this is amazing. You're a loony. I'll tell you what. I, I don't know if you've heard Aha's new album yet, but that is full of tingles. And I know... Some... I do I do, I do. do quite like Aha, especially their early stuff. No, but, but this, is, this, is, this is a return to... to, to it's very similar to, to some of the early stuff. It's called... Um, I'll tell you what it's called in a minute. I keep thinking it's called King of the North, but that's from that's from something else, isn't it? That's from Game of Thrones or something like that. It's, it's Game of Thrones. Uh, is it, it true, you know it's tr true North or something like that? I'll tell you exactly what it's called. True North by Aha. It's got one track on it called You Have What It Takes. If that yeah. doesn't send tingles down your spine, Mark, I'm a banana. <laughs> it's a superb no return worries, to form. A friend, thank you, mate. I'll get you an answer to that. I'm just going to wax lyrical about our half for a couple of minutes, so feel free to hang up. Pal of mine is a hotshot music critic. I won't tell you what newspaper he writes for because I don't want to embarrass him. Hotshot music critic, one of the best in the business. I turned him on to this the other day because, like a lot of people, he thinks that our half... A kind of an 80s teeny pop band, which they're just not. They're one of the finest live bands on the planet. There's a documentary about them which came out earlier this year that is, I mean, seminal, but the new album, True North, is a thing of absolute beauty. Well, so three albums came out at the same time, the new Arctic Monkeys album, the new Taylor Swift album, and the new AHA album, right? The AHA one is the best. And don't even at me. Don't even at me. Just thank me later. Thank you, Mark. Paul's in Worcester. Paul, question or answer? Answer, James. Carry on. Always good to speak to you. So, Air Force Security, um, yes. what they're doing is they're reducing the amount of a product that you can bring through, yes. and you were actually quite close to it. So, what happens is is that if you mix certain products together, they will then become dangerous products. Particularly, they can give off gases. So, yes. and, and they're in things like shampoos and other products, which I'm not going to go into. So, what they do is they reduce it right down to 100 mils. That if you then do happen to have nefarious means for doing things, is that you don't have enough of the product to bring together to become a hazard. Yeah. And so what, you what if you've got five little it. bottles of it, you would have enough. You could go into the you toilet. Wouldn't because, well, you wouldn't because what happens is, is you're restricted to one item and they do test them. Oh, so if you go and you, you watch, yeah. they do actually they actually do dip these things and put them into machines. To and say, sometimes they make you taste oh, it, don't they? I, I, I don't, they do. And so yeah. they'll, you know, that'll come up as a sh shampoo or an alkaline or an acid or something else. Yeah. So what they're trying to do is reduce. So if you bring alkalines and acids together they can then give off gases. Of if you bring certain cleaning materials together, you'll go, oh, that doesn't smell very nice, and some people have quite bad effects from that. Yeah. So That's what a brilliant answer. Is just, no, you've done thank it. Thank you. No, no, qualifications? Uh, paramedic. Okay, yeah, lovely one. Round of applause. Thank you. No, thank you. Great work. Nice one, Paul. And we tick that one off the list. Uh, Owen is in Anglesey. Owen, question or answer? Uh, question. Carry on. Right, um, me and my children were outside the other day and there was a massive thunderstorm. Hmm. And my son asked, how far away would you have to... Say, if you were swimming in the sea, yeah. how far would you have to be from the strike for you not to get electrocuted? Gosh. So, like, fork lightning hits the sea? Yeah. You're swimming in the sea, having a nice time. Well, you wouldn't be having that nice a time. It's a blooming thunderstorm, <laughs> isn't it? 
So lightning, well, no, you might be. You might be going, wow, man, this is incredible. I'm like communing with nature. Uh, yeah, and then yeah. and then if it hit you on the head, you'd be in all sorts of trouble. But if it was <laughs> if it was 10 yards away, would you be okay? 100 yeah. yards away? 100. Uh, so how, how far do you have to be for it to dissipate the danger? I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. I sh- well, I hope you never and find I'm not out. I'm asking the question... I'm not asking the question because it's my birthday either, hoping to win a, uh, a board game. Well played. I like that. I don't mind a little bit of cynical heart tugging. That's that's fine. But I'll I tell you what I will give you because Keith has had this ready. He's got this ready all the time. We only put it out about twice a year. Is that it? <laughs> when did, oh, where, James. Where, hang on. Stay there. Where did that, where did that come from? <laughs> that's Nick's, isn't it? It is fantastic. Thank you, Owen. We shall uh, endeavour to get you an answer to that. And uh, do we have to pay Nick Abbott a royalty for that now? Is that is that is that how? Is that only if someone tells him? Tina's in Lewis. Tina, question or answer? I have a question, please. Yeah, carry on. Um, I'd like to know why some of the tins in my cupboard. I I mean, I can stack them all but some of them stack with little lips onto each other and others the um, my hind soup for example don't so i want to know why because in my cupboard it's not a problem i've only got 10 tins but in a supermarket you've only got what 10 tins 10 10 tins of food. 10 tins tina's 10 tins <laughs> tina's so they could, do they call you 10 tin tina <laughs> They could do, couldn't they? Yes. I wish I had... Um, I was going to say I wish I had 12 now, but... 12 tins, Tina. 10 tins, Tina. 11. I wish I had 11. <laughs> <laughs> and if we're going down the birthday route, it was my birthday yesterday. Okay, concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> he's thank made you, a cross. You. He's made a cross for his own back now. You should see his face. <laughs> he's got oh, flipping out. I was trying to chill. Oh, I've done this now. I can't do. Um, I completely agree with you. D- D- Heinz beans are fine, but Heinz soups are not. No, I mean, and um, my tuna's fine. <laughs> tuna is a, is probably the most stackable of tins, isn't it? Because it's it's, yeah. it's short. It's 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 short and squat, so it, it sits. It doesn't topple as easily as a as a bigger tin, a more conventional tin. But then I was wondering if there's just something, you know, from the hind soup that a, a superiority thing. But I can put my, I can put. Oh, I didn't realise oh, that. Well done. <laughs> Tantina with a soup based pun. <laughs> I can put, I'm carrying on, I'm carrying on. I can put my supermarket tomatoes on top of my soup. So I'd, so it makes no sense to me. What, own brand? Oh, um, oh, brand ones, can I say the brand? Yeah, of course you can. <laughs> my Tesco's tomatoes can go on top of my Tesco's. Uh, the tinned oh, tomatoes soup. or the tinned soup? The tinned tomatoes can go on top of the tinned soup. Right, but the tin soup no... can't go on top of the tin tomatoes. Oh, let me just try. Yeah, go on, yeah. I'll wait. Ten tins. Yeah, no, look, listen, no, uh, no. Well, it will go on top, but it like. But it's to not sitting, it's not sitting comfortably. It, it isn't, no. Then I'll begin. No. Right, you're on. That's a brilliant <laughs> question, actually. I don't oh. really, I know it really is. I, we, I, have quite, I have more than ten tins in, in our cupboard, and I, I, <laughs> for some reason, I, I, I've taken it upon myself to... Um, uh, 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 be in charge of stacking the cupboards because I get so cross when we go out, when we buy something and then I find that we already had it in the cupboard. I'm turning into everybody's dad, basically. Is a short <laughs> way. So I stacked the tins. I even bought from Lakeland, Tina. I bought, you'll like this, Tin Tin Tina. I bought, I bought like a platform so that... Oh, right, yeah. Do you see yeah. what I mean? So, you, so yeah. instead of the tins being... You can't see what's behind. I've got a platform yeah. now so that the back row of tins sits slightly above the front row of tins. So you've got double the vision, but the same amount of tins. It's, it's impossible to lose a tin in my cupboard these days. Which I think would be great, but then my, I instantly go to that's something else to wipe, isn't it? Yeah, well, you don't have enough <laughs> tins, really, to worry about. You've only got ten tins, Tina. I've only got ten. So you do. don't need the tier. You don't need the tin tier. <laughs> That I've got for my tins, because I probably have 20 tins, 10 on each tier, 10 tier uh, tin, right, 10 tier right. tin, tin, tin. <laughs> I'm going to get you an answer if it kills me to that. That would be brilliant. Thank Thanks you, very Tina. much. Take Love care. Enjoy your lunch. It's half past 12. Holly Harris is here with the headlights. Mystery Hour with James O'Brien. This is LBC. It is 12.34 and uh, we've done that one. Why can't you smell on the way out? in the same way that you can smell on the way in. I like that question from Charlie, and, and I'm not going to let anybody tell me otherwise. Uh, why do some people get goosebumps or tingles when they are listening to music or watching telly, actually? You just get it like a moment, and you have a physical reaction to an emotional response. Um, that's for Mark. Why? How, 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 I think we did this relatively recently, but listen, I'm 50. 
I can't remember what I had for breakfast. Never mind what we did three weeks ago on Mystery Hour. But the, if a lightning hits the sea, how far away from the point of contact do you have to be to be safe? And why are Tina's tins not more easily stackable, particularly the Tesco tomato tins? No, the Tesco tomato tins, Tina's t- Tesco tomato tins are stackable, but the soup is not. And I love that question because if, if you're a bit a bit fussy about your cupboards like I am the tins that don't stack will they, they, oh they're the bane of my life I tell you and I've even got tears uh, not tiny tears <laughs> normal sized 12.35 is the time Mike's in Falmouth no, Mike question or answer hi James uh, question please carry on um, basically I'm just wondering whether it's possible for say a celebrity to copyright or trademark their voice so for example when you listen to a say a radio advert or mm. TV advert and you hear what you think sounds like a sort of familiar celebrity voice, obviously that company using that voice would probably cost quite a lot of money to use that celebrity. What stops them using a, say, impressionist or someone that can do a similar voice? That's a great um, question. That's a really, really good question, actually. Because, for example, if you, if you wanted to do a TV advert and someone wanted to use your voice... Well, I don't, what, action I, can you, what action can you take against I, them? I, I, I don't think I'd charge much more than an impressionist, to be honest with you. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I'm in that category. To be, but you never know. I mean, you know, cost of living crisis around the corner. I might get myself a voiceover agent. There you go, yeah. Could be quite nice. Um, but because you, you, there was a period, wasn't there, where every advert on television seemed to be the same people. Lovejoy, Ian McShane at one point. You're probably too young to remember. Mm. But there was a period when Ian McShane, I think, I counted him on three different adverts in one commercial break once. And so it's just because it's like fashion, almost. Obviously, the, yeah. p- the, 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 the focus groups say that some voices are really, really trustworthy. But I don't know if it was him. Maybe it was someone who was deliberately trying to sound like him. Peter Kay, yeah, exactly. very distinctive voice. You, you'd really spot him on a voiceover. Tony Slattery used to do loads, I think, back in... Stephen Fry has done a lot of, 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 at least we think he has, but if you find someone doing a brilliant Stephen Fry impression... And you get the guy that's doing the X Factor kind of voice as well, but that's so similar yeah. to kind of copy. Or John it? Bent, so, was it John Bent, Marcus Bentley, uh, um, uh, Big Brother? Dear uh, uh, Six, uh, yeah. him. That's like he's in the room, isn't it, Mike? That's uncanny. I mean, is he able to sue Dear Six? <laughs> is he able now to sue me for doing an absolutely pitch-perfect impression of him? So if you did yeah. it, if you had a very good Stephen Fry impersonation on an advert for crisps would Stephen Fry have any recourse based upon the fact that everybody listening is clearly intended to believe that that is Stephen Fry yeah that's a great question why why do you want to know what have you got planned Uh, who can you do what voices can you do (laughs) I I could do nothing I I was just listening to the advert and I thought that sounds like somebody and then I thought well is it actually them or is it someone that sounds like them yeah I I do that in here sometimes I say to Keith is that so and so so, so we don't often we don't know actually I like that can you do that can you can you in any way trademark a voice 03456060973 Paul's in Runcorn Paul question or answer Answer on the Heinz Beans tins. Carry on. Tina's tins. Uh, Tina's tins, Thank yeah. You. Um, so it's to do with how they are manufactured. So some of them they'll just roll up a bit of metal and stick a top and bottom on. And then others, like the Heinz ones, are kind of like pressed through to form a shape with then just the lid put on top. And that's why they don't stack. Although, so you should then, on the Heinz ones, even if they've got the ring pour on the top, be able to flip them over and then open them with a can opener on the bottom. Oh, but yeah. the pressed ones, like your... Why don't they do them all brand, the same? Why don't they do them all the same? Um, so I think the, the tins where they stick the top and bottom on are sort of a, a cheaper quality. So part of Heinz's reason for doing it is because they're less likely to have a seal break and cause leaks and damage and so stuff like that. So they do it with the soup but not with the beans. They'll do the cheaper tin for the soup than they do for the beans. Well, I think all Heinz tins are just kind of all come out the factory. No, 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 you weren't listening. Tina was absolutely clear. You can stack the beans but you can't stack the um, soups. So, so that'll think, be it then. What? So they don't want the, the soup leaking at the bottom of your tin if so, the seal's not done. So what's well. the cheaper one? The cheaper ones, they're just where they roll a bit of tin and then stick Yeah, but is that the on. soup? Is the soup in the cheaper tin? No, the soup's in the nicer tin. So, the, be- so the more expensive tins are the ones that you can't stack? The, uh, yeah, incredibly. That makes no yeah. sense. That makes no sense. <laughs> what are your qualifications? Uh, qualifications are, um, I 
swapped with my wife and became a house husband about six years ago oh, and then nice. suddenly realised that you can't put things in the cupboard nicely if you buy So this is brands. entirely speculative then, your answer? Well, I sort of researched it years and years ago um, w- when we swapped over and I had to learn how to do different things like operate a washing machine and put groceries away and things like that and they become... And wait, So you uh, research think, why some tins are stackable and so I just don't understand why yes. they'd pay more money on making a tin less convenient. Well, I, I don't know. You should... I, I don't work for Heinz. No, well, no, you um, can't yeah, do it, this. You can't, the, you, can't cl- you can't claim your correct <laughs> answer and then just it, dismiss my quibbles because I don't, I don't buy your do qualifications. The, the better quality of tin that won't leak, but in the pressing process, then they don't stack. It doesn't make sense. You would... Because it would be... Because stacking would be a priority and leakability would be a priority. So the better tins, the best... T- 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 oh, no, maybe no. God, no, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. Maybe but, the price you pay for having a better quality tin is is the lack of stackability. Yeah. I'm going to give you... I, don't, I mean, it's not the best qualification I've ever heard, Paul. Well, you know, I, I think it's important that we're breaking down these cultural barriers. I knew you were going to say that, because I'm not having that, actually. <laughs> I'm not in any way like commenting, passing comment Ooh. upon gender stereotypes or the division of household labour. I'm merely questioning the quality of your qualification. Because, actually, if you want to get all feminist about it, that means literally anybody who you would describe or we would describe as a housewife would have full qualifications to answer this question, which may include Tina. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you I'll a take, small. I'll take half, I'm, no, I'm not giving you half. half. You've talked your way out of half. I'm going to give you a tiny snatch oh. of applause. Oh, yeah. there we go. Thank you very well, much. Thanks, and I'll give you the rest you, of it if it turns out to be right. But I'm not having that. It just it started well. I don't know. It all fell apart towards the end. Why can you stack some tins and not others? James is in Crowthorn. James, question or answer? Oh, I've got a question, please, James. Carry on. Uh, it's actually from my son, who's six. His name's Max. Okay. And every night he asks me a question before he goes to bed. Good. I and like I don't have habit. an answer for this one. Okie dokie. <laughs> so when you eat or drink something, yes. sometimes you produce gases yes. that either come out of your mouth or a little lower down. Yes. How, how does your body decide which end to produce the gas? So uh. if you drink a can of Coke, how does that come out of the burp? But if you eat something else, it comes out as yeah. wind. In yeah. And I just don't have an answer. So I'm hoping there's a doctor somewhere that might have some... Why does... Some, yeah, how does... What determines whether the gas goes up or down? Absolutely. And I just don't have an answer. No, I like that one, actually. Well done, Max. It's a good question. Although I suspect that the language <laughs> he deployed was a little less... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 I kept it. Uh, kept it well, I'm, I'm grateful that you did. It's a family program, as you demonstrate by bringing Max's question to the table. Um, I saw, right, I, I, that's a really, uh, yeah, how does it? I mean, because it's not obvious, is it? Because I was going to say, well, it depends whether it's reached digestive state, but sometimes you can do a burp and you can taste what you what you ate. Yeah, yeah, long, uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, um, hang yeah. on, does that take us back to to Charlie's question about noses? It might well do. You can smell stuff on the way out sometimes. Oh, this is getting all very biological and anatomical. We shall find out for you, or at least for Max. Thank you, James. Why? How? What determines which way gas goes, up or down, during the digestive process? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Louisa is in Hackney. Louisa, question or answer? It's an answer. Carry James. on. Carry on. Carry on. It's about copywriting your voice. Oh yes. Uh, in, there are two parts to this answer. Firstly, in this country, the Advertising Standards Authority has rules about passing off. So they wouldn't allow someone to use an impression of a voice that led people to think that person was actually sanctioning their product when they weren't. Okay. So it can be used in parody and for fun. So if, it, if, you, were, if, it was, if, you, if you got someone to do the voice of Margaret Thatcher or Ronald Reagan to yes. sell, I don't know, dog food, everyone would know it wasn't really them. Exactly. Okay. So there, 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 there is a process by which almost all commercials in this country had to go through an approval process and they wouldn't be able to get away with it. Uh... Um, as far as copyright is concerned, it's a bit more problematic. Um, so at the moment, there's a Copyright Act going through Parliament to change the copyright law. And with AI coming on and um, being able to synthesise voices or not use that much of somebody's recording to copy their voice, mm. uh, at the moment, Equity and various other um, creators' unions are pushing for more 
coverage for more rights, basically, because the act as it currently exists, if someone, for example, was to synthesise your voice, yes. uh, <coughs> you would have, under this current new act going through Parliament, no rights. What? They could sell it, and you would have no rights. The, um, the AI companies currently are allowed to scrape for information to teach their software, but they're not allowed to commercialise what they've learnt in that sense. Right. But the new act, I believe, um, will lift that restriction. So mm. somebody could synthesise a voice using maybe parts of your voice or even your whole voice and use it and make money from it and you would have no rights. But they couldn't put it on an advert? No, but they could put it on a corporate video that you wouldn't necessarily know was happening or they could create a sample that they said you said on your radio programme that you didn't say. (gasps) And it's a huge minefield. I'm going going to find out a little bit more. Talk to Equity. The Musicians Union have similar concerns about musicians and sampling. And at the moment, the government seem to be leaning more towards supporting innovation than necessarily protecting the rights of the original creators. The rights of the artists. It's a lot of problem, yeah. Um, thank you for that. I, I, I mean, I have to ask what your qualifications are, although you've provided some clues. I'm a professional voiceover artist. I thought you might be. I could tell it <laughs> when you came on. You could, do you want I'm to mention any a, any of your recent work? Have we heard it lately? Um, there's things I can't tell you about. No. Um, you might have heard me in randomly an MRI scanner. Gosh. Or uh, <laughs> there's various commercials on the radio, on television I I'm on. So. Um, I pop up in all sorts of random places. Fantastic. And, and you earn a, <laughs> a round of applause. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. And you have a beautiful voice, I, I, as I'm sure I'm not the first person to tell you. 12.46 is the time. This is LBC Mystery Hour with James O'Brien. Call 0345 6060 973. 12.51 is the time. The, the, the tin stuff is really going... Well, I mean, people are sending me footage of unstackable Heinz Beans tins now. Maybe the premise of the question was wrong. Maybe I under, misunderstood 10 tin Tina's original... She said the soup didn't stack, I think, but the beans... Di- well, it doesn't matter. Why do some tins stack and other tins don't? Quick word about my, my colleagues over at Capital Breakfast who've been teasing me. I go, I feel, I'm feeling quite discriminated. I think it's getting a bit ageist now. Uh, mocking me for... Um, uh, plug in the Jingle Bell Ball, which is going to be amazing this year. I think Stormzy's doing Sunday night, isn't he? I so absolutely sensational. No, Stormzy's doing the Saturday night. It's going to be sensational. Um, and and they busted me completely for nearly calling them children. I heard it on yesterday's show. And I, what I was doing, I was trying to do some banter, like cross station banter. It's, it's you know like the good old days of Smashy and Nicey. And and I said the ch- uh, chill on the youths. But they played it out on the Capital Breakfast Show and they completely... But I can't even pretend that I haven't been caught bang to rights. I was in the process of calling them children. And then I remembered that Sean and Sonny J are my, my... They're my teammates on Eggheads. It hasn't gone out yet, actually. And they were brilliant. They did a lot better than me. They were brilliant on it. So I thought, well, I can't call them... I don't mind calling Roman a child, Roman Kemp. I'm interviewing his dad on Full Disclosure this week. So it would be somehow appropriate, really, for me to reference his... His childishness, but I didn't want to insult. <laughs> I didn't want to insult um, Sean and Sonny J. And then I listened to it yesterday morning, and Sean is leading the attacks on me. Frankly, so I, I, I regret my, I regret my kindness and my concern for for those children. Twelve fifty two is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Back to mystery. Our Dean is in Miyazaki in Japan. Crikey, question or answer, Dean. It's an answer, thank you. Um, well pronounced, by the way. <laughs> thank you very much. It's quite phonetic, isn't it, I think? Kind of. Anyway, yeah, it's not too bad we? once you get used to it, actually, Thanks. and it's an easy place. Um, I'm ringing about the question about why you cannot smell when you breathe out. Yes. So there's two parts to this. Um, the first part is what happens when you actually breathe in. So when you breathe in, along the mucus of your nose are these things called odorant-binding proteins, and mm. they grab a hold of what you smell, and they take it to the receptors. That's how you smell. Um, things that are particularly pungent usually bind to these very, very well and, you know, kind of overload your sense. Yeah. So when you're breathing out, well, what are you breathing out? This, that's the second part. It's respiration. When you breathe oxygen in, you breathe carbon dioxide out. And that's the only real thing apart from nitrogen that you're breathing out in uh, any substantial amount. And this is respiration as, so par- as opposed to smell. burping or something like that. It's, it's respiration yeah. that you're describing. So there's nothing coming exactly. out. So you, exactly. So you bring in oxygen in, carbon dioxide and some nitrogen as well, coming out 
But at the same time, there's nothing for those proteins as it's coming out to kind of grab and take to your receptors to smell. Beautifully done. Qualifications? Um, I did a chemistry degree a number of years ago now, 10 years ago, I feel old. Um, and I, my, my um, thesis was on using odor and binding proteins to detect explosives. So I had to kind of learn the um, olfactory process somewhat. At the Sensational. Time. Round of applause for Dean. And what took you to Miyazaki? Um, I came here just to kind of travel, to be honest with you. Um, and then I kind of got, you know, I kind of enjoyed it. It's kind of nice. It's a surfing town. It's sunny. Cool beans. Enjoy. Thank you, Dean. Lovely stuff. 12.55 is the time. Hi, James. It's Colin. What was the name of that song on the new AHA album that you love so much? It's called uh, You Have What It Takes. Colin, doing some music recommendations over there. Can hear them quaking in their boots over at Capital Radio because now I'm doing music recommendations. Just watch this space. Jason's in Southampton. Jason, question or answer? Hello, James. Uh, it's an answer to your can question. Right, come on then. So tins, tins, not cans. Tins. 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 Okay, so... Yeah. Very basically, it's all to do with the way the ingredients are cooked inside the can at uh-huh. the factory. So when they put when they can the beans, they seal the beans and they have to cook it at a different temperature by steam or whatever the hues. They the cook the beans in the tin. Yes. Oh my days! So it becomes a, it becomes a cylinder. So therefore, yeah. it has to be sealed in a different way to stand the pressure. So uh, the way the way they cook it. So right. if you ever ever realise sometimes when you pull the ring pull on a modern can, sometimes it lets pressure out, doesn't it? It, it does always, actually. And that's because it's been cooked in the can. Well, you live and learn. So the ones that... And which ones can you stack and which ones can't you stack? Well, I'll be honest, I didn't... I, I'm using my common sense for this knowledge, but I also oh. watched a BBC programme with that Greg Wallace. Oh, in the, the factory or something like that. It's good, isn't it? Yes. That? I like that. That's it. Uh, uh, I don't know which way round it is, but... The, the ingredients, the machines make the ingredients, they put them in the can, they seal the can, they cook the ingredients, and that's where they get the pressure in the can from. So the different cans are manufactured to stand different pressures. Um, that, so that's the answer is going to be the, the, some tins are cooked in the tin, some products are cooked in the tin and some products aren't, and that determines their stackability. But we Correct. don't know which way round it is. Correct. Love it. Qualifications, saw it on the telly. Round of applause for Jason. That'll do nicely. There we go. I hope hope Tina is satisfied with that answer. 12.57 is the time. Andy's in Coventry. Andy, question or answer? It's an answer. Carry on. So it's a question to do with the gases. Um, Why some come from the top uh, where you burp and other ones at the back? Yes. So you were partially writing an answer, really. Thank you. Um, When we... When we eat food, we obviously chew it and we swallow it, and that's put air with it as we swallow. Yes. So that air will build up in the stomach, and the stomach wants to, to release the air, so you burp the air out. Yes. Um, from the sphincter. Now, from the other <laughs> end, so all that food we've, we've had, we've gone through the digestion process. Yes. It's gone through your stomach and everything else, and it's gone through the intestines, um... and there are gases that are produced from the digestion processes which is why we get gases yeah. and it's just too far for it to come back I, 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 yeah i mean it's reached the bowels and everything by then yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and you so it goes out your bum foot long yeah yeah, yeah. there it is yeah. oh, brilliant answer so why then and also so the reason why sometimes when you burp you can get a nice little reminder of what you've been eating or drinking is is actually it just brings a bit with it it, it, it hits it Oh. Sheila, yeah. do you mind? I'm trying to present oh, a radio. I'm stop. trying to present a radio program. So it's it's undigested at that point. It's the air yeah, coming right, back yeah. up, but bringing with it yeah. some of the aromas of whatever delicious pro- comestibles you've recently consumed. Yeah, and if you eat very hot food, you burp a lot sooner because you swallow a lot of air as you're eating it because it's too hot. To cool so it or fizzy ingest. or very fizzy drinks, or you will burp fizzy. a lot more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. what a brilliant answer, Andy. Qualifications? I'm a medical education nurse. Oh, well, I well, take a huge round of applause for Andy. Thank Absolutely you. beautifully done. Did we get every single thing this week? Have we gone? Have we got? So we did the little bottles. We didn't do the goosebumps and lightning. Very, very frightening. Did we? Why do you get goosebumps? Why do some people get goosebumps when they're listening to music while other people don't? That was lovely. Well done. Um, I need to pick a winner, and I'm really torn now. I'm really torn between Andy because I thought his answer was utterly delightful. 
and Tentintina, who I thought her question was charming. I'm going to consult my colleagues. Actually, short of time. Quickly, Keith, for a quick vote. Eleanor? Tina. Oh, it's Tina. Ten, ten, Tina all the way. Andy, I, I'd have given it to you, mate, but, but they're just not very nice people. Uh, Sheila Fogarty's here. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow at 10. I'm still reeling from the burping and the things coming out of your bottom. You said sphincters. Oh, there you go. As you do. It was like walking into a kind of all-male college junior common room when I came in today, mainly because of your end of the conversation. 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 Your end of the conversation.